Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call the order for the August 22nd, 2023 meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Madam Clerk, if we could begin with a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Cummings? Here. Hernandez? Present. McPherson? Here. And Friend? Here, and I'm in uh, Sacramento right now because I'm going to be testifying soon. Yeah, I'd just like to um, dedicate today's moment of silence to the um, community of Lahaina in Maui. I know that you know we faced a fire, and um, I don't think we've met since that fire has happened. And so, just you know, letting the folks know that our hearts go out to the people of Maui and the people of Lahaina, with 850 people still. Um, not being found, I think that we're going to see the death toll rise, and so our hearts go out to all the people in that community that was impacted by those devastating fires. Uh, yes, uh, Chair Friend and Board of the Supervisors, there's one change on the consent agenda, uh, item number 39. Staff requests that this item be deleted from this agenda and we be brought back at a later date. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any supervisors that would like to pull an item off of today's consent agenda to put on the regular agenda? Okay. Seeing none, we're going to open it up to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda, both in the purview of the Board of Supervisors, as well as any comments you'd like to make on the consent agenda or the regular agenda if you can't uh, wait for that. Please feel free to step forward. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. My name is Adrienne Saxton, and I'm here to acknowledge the important work that community health workers have in our community and um, by reading a proclamation. So Santa Cruz County Board of Sur Supervisors proclamation proclaiming August 28th to September 1st, 2023 as National Community Health Workers Week in Santa Cruz County. Whereas the National Association of Community Health Workers has developed the first ever national campaign to celebrate and commemorate community health workers for the week of August 28th through September 1st, 2023. And whereas community health workers are individuals who are frontline public health workers who are trusted members of and or have an unusually close understanding of the community they serve. And whereas CHW is an umbrella term that can include promotoras, community health representatives, and other 90 other job titles, and under this umbrella term for many decades, CHWs are a unique workforce, diverse in ethnicity, language, and culture, and recognized as health professionals by the Affordable Care Act. And whereas CHWs play a crucial role in societal health care efforts as documented in countless randomized control trials, system, systematic reviews, and return on investment studies of CHW interventions, and are increasingly recognized for their contributions to addressing racial equity and the social determinants of health by connecting individuals to basic needs and by organizing communities to address inequitable social conditions. And whereas at the breakdown of the Pajaro River levee, levee in March 2023, which flooded the community of Pajaro, multicultural and multilingual CHWs were essential in Santa Cruz County's effort to meet the needs of the displaced community members by providing resources and access to community services. Um, hi, my name is Haley Mears. I'm with the Health Improvement Partnership of Santa Cruz County, and I'm just going to finish the rest of the proclamation. 
Whereas CHWs are a precarious workforce that need improved policy, funding, and legal support to promote their sustainability, professional development, career ladders, and recognition for their integral role in reducing health inequities. We have a, um, Zach, our chair of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors, hereby proclaimed on behalf of the county and all residents thereof the week of August 28th through September 1st, um, 2023 as Community Health Worker Awareness Week and encourage the many community, agency, and business partners to support local, state, and national efforts that improve policies that respect, protect, and authentically partner with the CHW profession and recognize it as a vital local workforce in Santa Cruz County, the state and across our nation and an important driver to reduce racial health inequities. And it was signed um, August 15th, to, uh, 2023. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Good morning and welcome. <laughs> Hello, my name is Laura Chatham and I came, um, I want to thank you for doing the hard work. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Can I start over? Um, my name, because that's, that's long. My name is Laura Chatham. I want to thank you for doing the hard work of being county supervisors. I know that there's a lot of difficult things going on in the county. And so you need people like me to come and tell you about it. Today, I would like to bring your attention the County Mental Health Advisory Board. Last week, we welcomed back our new behavioral health director, Tiffany Sin. Cantrell Warren, returned from maternity leave, another beautiful May baby. And Tiffany returned just in time for the mental health um, advisory board response to the grand jury report um, about entitled underfunded, understaffed, and overworked. I have a copy here, and I see it as number 18 on the consent agenda for today. We have known there is a hiring problem within behavioral health department for a long time, for years. It isn't new and it is crippling our behavioral health department. I would like to request the Board of Supervisors instruct the personnel department to work with behavioral health to fix the hiring process. We could use Mental Health Services Act innovation funds to innovate and improve our hiring and recruitment. The Mental Health Oversight and Accountability Commission sent us the document that Amador County wrote to use their mental health um, Services Act innovation funds to improve the, their hiring process. I emailed it to you last week and I, I gave two, the first two pages to pass out. Um, the Behavioral Health Department should rewrite our application to focus on the real problem, which is hiring, instead of wasting that money on doing another study with an Arizona company to find out what we already know. We have plenty of great programs, just not enough services. There's long waiting lists for all our programs because we don't have enough staff. The, um, Thank you, ma'am. RII study will take val valuable time from our staff to work on an, another. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for waiting. It was, I spoke before you briefly two weeks ago. There I sounded a somewhat discordant note, I'm afraid suggesting that there's actually a crisis in our political institutions and public health institutions. And we might not recognize this in Santa Cruz, and I don't want to disparage the work of any community health workers. I'm sure their intentions are noble, but I'm afraid that the reality of what is about us is much more disturbing. For that reason, I suggest that we call something like a truth and reconciliation Asian Commission as they had in South Africa after apartheid, because it's time for us to look back on the last three years and evaluate every decision was made. Every community health organization needs to be examined for what financial incentives they gave to give to give the vaccine. We need a full uh, exploration of all communications. And I invite the supervisors to take leadership in this by being fully transparent in all of their activities and communications and decision-making structures in the last three years. I wanna speak directly to Chairman Friend because uh, on the one hand, I feel conflicted because I, I honor and appreciate the hard work of public service. And I, I know that you're all doing your very best, but I'm troubled by 
Chairman Friend's suggestion that AI tools could potentially analyze complex legal briefs, and that's a, a suggestion for how we might go about this. I don't think that's going to be possible for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission because that's something that needs human judgment, and we can't do that with AI. I would also like to invite Chairman Friend to bring back Professor Rebecca Dubois from the Engineering Department, whom he had a virtual town hall with on January 5th, 2021. She made the statements that the vaccines were, no corners were cut making the vaccines. She said that natural immunity was not protective and that everyone, whether or not they had had COVID, should go out and get that. I would invite Chairman Friend to bring Professor Dubois back and have a full disclosure Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Nancy Macy. I'm chair of the Valley Women's Club Environmental Committee. We recently had the opportunity to present the Commission on the Environment with solid research and reasoning behind the benefits of instituting a new franchise agreement with PG&E. We sincerely hope that you will prioritize the time to read the Commission's letter with its attachments included under correspondence in today's agenda packet. The COE voted unanimously to provide the board with this information and recommends the board analyze the annual, annual franchise fees paid to the county. The current franchise agreement is a boilerplate ordinance approved back in 1955. PG&E committed to provide a system installed, constructed, and maintained in a good and workmanlike manner. However, PG&E has failed for decades to maintain no less comprehensively upgraded system. The result? less reliability and safety. Climate change has exacerbated PG&E's many infrastructure cause ignitions, creating deadly conflagrations year after year, despite the millions and millions of trees they have cut down. In contrast, Southern California Edison has been comprehensively modernizing its system with great success, with over 5,000 circuit miles replaced, ignitions in those high fire threat areas have been eliminated. PG&E has apparently abandoned public safety power shut off, so no more warnings of a pending outage. Since cutting off power is the only way for PG&E to prevent fires, we now have EPSS repeatedly without warning, causing severe personal and financial hardship to residents and businesses time and time again. Along with other organizations working to motivate oversight agencies like the CPUC, CAL FIRE, the OEIS, and the legislature, we've seen but minimal improvements, damages continue, and massive cost increases threaten. However, We've recognized the real potential of local government taking back its authority through franchise agreements. Please consider the possibilities. Thank you, Ms. Bates. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, my name is Brett Garrett. I live again in the city of Santa Cruz and I'm a steering committee member of the California Alliance for Community Energy. Uh, speaking only for myself today, I want to support the Valley Women's Club's recommendation to renegotiate the franchise agreement with PG&E. There is so much good information in the packet of information that was provided in today's agenda packet. Um, and actually, I would like to take their recommendation a step further. I, I, I'd like to fire PG&E. This company is a cr criminal enterprise that literally burned down paradise. Please terminate the PG&E agreement, buy the assets, form a municipal utility district to provide electricity for our residents and businesses. The cost of buying the um, infrastructure is a small fraction of what we're already paying PG&E. Santa Cruz County is so much larger than cities that have their own munici uh, municipal utilities, such as the city of Alameda, Lompoc, Palo Alto, Ucaya, Needles, Shasta Lake. Tiny cities have their own municipal utilities, so why shouldn't we? Uh, municipal utilities in general provide much better pricing and better reliability than PG&E. SMUD, for example, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District is half the cost of PG&E. Um, PG&E charges us high transmission charges, regardless of whether the energy is coming from across the street or across the state, we still pay transmission if it's next door. The system is rigged to facilitate a boondoggle of more and more transmission lines to profit PG&E. We need a different billing structure that encourages local renewable generation, including community microgrids. We need lower rates, especially for low-income folks and disadvantaged communities. We need to stop the solar tax that is impending. Um, 
And any franchise agreement with pg e must include an expiration date. The sooner, the better. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, my name is Susan Nielsen, and I'm a librarian at Santa Cruz Public Libraries. I'm proud to provide library programs and services to incarcerated adults and youth in our county corrections facilities. I'm also an active participant in the Commission on Justice and Gender. Today, I want to applaud those who worked so hard to reopen Blaine facility, women's facility. The library is so grateful to be able to provide books and weekly classes for incarcerated women again. We truly hope that Blaine will continue to stay open beyond the time when the electrical upgrade at the main jail is completed. Incarcerated women in our county need the same access to opportunities, programs like ours from the library and Cabrillo's Rising Scholars, at the same ones that the men. They need the same access to opportunities that men get at Roundtree Facility. I'd also really like to see the return of in-person visitation for children and incarcerated parents. Physical interaction between parent and child is how children are reassured that their absent parent is safe and still loves them. Reducing anxiety and emotional harm to children of incarcerated parents is an important way to reduce cycles of trauma in our community. As it stands now, there's no way to know how many children in our county have incarcerated parents. Could a question like, are you the parent of minor children be added to the jail intake process? Knowing how many parents in our facilities would help children and it would help organizations like mine to get more and more relevant support and resources to families who need them. Thank you all and thanks again for all your work to keep Blaine open. It really is making a world of difference. Thank you for those comments. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. My name is Faye Johnson. I'm a longtime San Ronaldo Valley resident. I live um, at uh, Upper East, by God's eye, Andy. We are eight and a half miles up a windy road, and we are at the end of the line, literally, for PG&E. We, there are 18 homes on the little dog leg that goes across the creek and across the canyon and then back to us. So when we have an emergency power shut off, there is very little bang for the buck for PG&E to come hook us back up. And when the power goes out, it's going to be out for days or weeks or we don't know. And they don't tell us. They they come up with some reinst reinstatement time 10 minutes after it goes out and then they just change it when they can't meet it. So um, when the power goes out, that's when all the generators start. And they're diesel generators and gas generators. And we have all of the racket and all of the stench from all of that. This is not sustainable. And it's time that PG&E is being held accountable through looking at their franchise agreement. And it's it should start with you. We're asking you to start that process. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. I'm Bracken Andrews, a member of the San Lorenzo Valley Women's Club Environmental and PG&E Committee. I was part of the BWC group that presented information on creating a new franchise agreement with PG&E to the County Commission of the Environment. The commission gave the Board of Supervisors recommendations along with our attached documents. I hope the supervisors will go over these attachments and have a favorable consensus to the creation of a new franchise agreement with PG&E. More than half of Santa Cruz County residents live in a high fire risk wildland urban interface, the highest percentage of any county in California. Most of these areas have dangerous bare power wires, which can cause fires and power outages. For more detailed information, please see the packet that you received. Fire dispatch data for Santa Cruz County shows how severe the issue of wires down has been. 
In 2021, there were 797 wires down. In 2022, 559. As of July 20th of this year, 1,026. Many of these can be live and sparking. Santa Cruz County has almost 880 miles of distribution lines in high fire threat areas. pg e undergrounding wires is just, <clears throat> excuse me, not feasible for most of the uh, narrow mountain roads with rocky terrain and would be very damaging to our trees, our environment, and our watershed. Plus, it would take many years of the slow pace pg e is moving of only three miles in Santa Cruz County this year. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for waiting. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kristen Sandell. I'm a member of the VWC. I've lived in the San Lorenzo Valley for 30 years and sure. Okay. Can you hear me? Right. And we have never had power outages like the ones we've seen in the past two years. These outages are not only disruptive, they're dangerous. This year alone, we've had dozens of outages, including outages of nearly two weeks over the winter. That was due to natural disaster, but as our weather patterns are disrupted and extreme weather becomes more common, less urban areas will bear the brunt of our failing infrastructure. And as California pushes for statewide renewable, green energy and electrification, the burden on our power grid will increase exponentially. We need that grid to be updated, safe and reliable. My house is 20 minutes from downtown. It's not even very rural, yet we routinely see outages, downed wires, failing equipment. Shutting off the power during fire season should not be PG&E's primary tool to reduce wildfire risk. A few years ago, we had a power pole and live lines come down on our road when a tree fell. My neighbor was a PG&E lineman and they had just replaced those lines with insulated wire. Those fully electrified but insulated lines lay on top of a pile of debris for nearly six hours, hot, before being shut off and did not spark a fire. That one section of insulated line probably saved us from a potentially dangerous situation since the wire was across the road and we couldn't drive out. When the county set up its franchise agreement with PG&E in 1955, it also assumed the responsibility to ensure that contract served its residents well to protect us and our environment. PG&E has not lived up to its responsibilities to us. Please read through the County Commission on the Environment's excellent letter to you on the franchise agreement and the supporting materials attached. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. I'm really freaked out about the central bank digital currency and vehemently oppose it. After my experiences in family court that has all the hallmarks of the satanic religion with people wearing black robes, how much more obvious can you get, who are stealing, killing, and destroying children and families in satanic ritualistic abuse and rewarding the minions with lots of money, um, it suddenly dawned on me that the paper fiat debt-based currency we are using since the 90s, 1970s says, in God we trust. But which God is that? I always thought it was God Almighty, Heavenly Creator. But now that I've learned that the central banker's fiat currency is a debt-based and Ponzi scheme, I began to wonder if they are referring to the God Satan. So I want nothing to do with it. I propose we in Santa Cruz go back to physical metals. Someone gave me a silver coin stamped $1. It's one ounce. But it now takes 36.6 fiat pieces of this paper to buy that one ounce silver as of this morning. Jesus Christ was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, which technically still exists today in one form or another. The United States dollar that we use today has only been around for 50 years. It's nothing more than a number printed on a piece of paper with green ink. If I put a piece of paper written with a five in one hand and one with one written on the other, close my eyes, I can't tell the difference. But if I put one ounce of silver in one hand and a quarter ounce of silver in the other and close my eyes, I can feel the difference because it's real and has intrinsic value. The central bank digital currencies are just a number made up on a computer screen. It doesn't mean anything. So I propose we use real money that is time tested for thousands of years. Go back to silver, coin, gold, and other precious metals. That's just my opinion. And I'm wondering why the United States flag isn't in the middle of those two flags, front and center, according to 4 US 7 on flag, how to hang a flag. Thank you. 
Good morning and welcome. Good morning. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I live in the Santa Cruz Mountains in rural Laptops. I'm going to address your board this morning as the board of directors of Santa Cruz County Fire Department, because that is what you are. I want to first apologize for running over so long in my testimony when Chief Armstrong was here and gave you the uh, 2023 fire update. Two minutes is not very long to say a lot, and it turns out three minutes isn't either. So I want to apologize, first of all, for running over. There was a lot I needed to say. There's a lot you need to hear from the people. And what I really wanted to say and didn't have time to say at your last meeting was that Santa Cruz County Fire Department needs to do an after action review of the CZU fire. We're here on the third anniversary of that devastating event. People are still recovering. And we need to look at what happened well and what didn't happen well in that fire. With the Santa Cruz County Fire Department volunteers, those people stayed behind. They saved homes at a time when CAL FIRE was telling them to go home, go away. We've got to look at why that happened. We've got to look at what went well. And rather than relying 100% on the AP Triton County Fire Master Plan that was supposed to be done by your appointees on the County Fire Advisory Commission, it was wrested away from them. County Fire is now paying tens of thousands of dollars to have a consultant do it that doesn't know our county. Please have an after action review with the Santa Cruz County Volunteer Fire Department people and the community and get this good planning information solid and moving forward. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. Welcome. Morning, Chair Friend, uh, members of the board. My name is Jim Heaney. I am a shop steward here at the County of Santa Cruz. This morning, myself and a number of our members will address you on a subject which has to do with probationary employees. If you're not aware, uh, when you get hired at the County of Santa Cruz, you serve a probationary period, unlike board members who serve a four-year period uh, and, and, and then follow up with an election. Uh, most employees serve a six-month period. And through that, we have a process of evaluating those employees. And those employees are essentially at will and can be released at the end of the probation if they are uh, you know, deemed not acceptable. We have a long-standing past practice that when this occurs, we have an appeal process. And that's what I'm here to address today. We need to re retain and remain having that appeal process for the employees because it really is a life-changing event when you come to work for somewhere like the county. After six months, you get released and you have no way to say, hey, I don't think this is fair. And I will try to give you a quick example. Many years ago, when I was first a shop steward, one of my coworkers was sitting at her desk. Well, a fellow coworker yelled at her and used the F word repeatedly. What happened at that time was the supervisor walked up and asked, what did you do to upset him so much? Let's blame the victim. Good thing is 20 years later, we learned not to do that as much. So I... Fought, I filed an appeal, we were successful, and that employee was an employee for over eight years until the layoffs came in 2008. So to tell you it's a life-changing event, that woman is my wife, that woman is the mother of my granddaughter, and so it is very personal to me that we should not be changing this because, you know, it does make a difference. And I will tell you, it's very de minimis, the number of times we deal with this is less than a dozen appeals a year, and when they are successful, they matter to people. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for sharing the story. Good morning and welcome. Thank you for waiting. Good morning, Co. Britton, Matt's Britton Architects. Um, I'm here today to talk about a coastal development permit on Beach Drive. It took many years and litigation and also the county's own legal expert witness telling environmental planning staff that they were wrong. Hundreds of thousands of dollars, years in time. A part of this coastal development permit is a landside mitigation structure. It's below pin piers, below steel mash on another property. We obtained this permit, or we were in process of getting our building permit 
And we got the correction because a landslide occurred while we were waiting for the permit that we needed to get amendment to the permit because a landslide occurred. Well, guess what's going to happen if we apply for amendment to that permit? The geologists have said that we're likely to have another landslide. So this is going to be a constant loop of applying for a CDP amendment for something that's going to be ongoing. To give you an example, we have a project that is an emergency shoreline protection structure. EP staff said it was an emergency. Coastal staff, geologists, and engineers said, yes, it is an emergency. So we are installing this emergency coastal protection structure. It is legally one, not like what the pin piers are claimed to be. Um, but guess what happens every day? It erodes. We don't get another coastal development permit because we'd have to do one every day. Part of what's going on here is that staff has absurd interpretation of code. Nobody wrote code to have this happen. So it's bad interpretation of code if you get an absurd result. And this board really needs to talk to Mr. Machado and fix this stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bruden. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Honorable Board. My name is Emily Chung. I am the Public Health Division Director for Health Services Agency for the county. I want to thank the board for proclaiming August 31st as International Awareness Day, International Overdose Awareness Day. Within this proclamation, we acknowledge that there are, um, we are remembering those we have lost due to the Im impacts of substance use and that we want to continue providing equitable services and reducing stigma for those impacted. It reminds us also that last year in 2022, our county uh, witnessed 98 individuals losing their lives to accidental overdose, which is a tragic number that we want to reduce. The resolution also reminds us that we support CDC evidence-based strategies, including naloxone distribution, medication-assisted treatment, 911 Good Samaritan laws, and harm reduction activities like syringe services exchange programs. It is also very timely that uh, starting next week, we will begin town halls related to opioid settlement funds planning. So our county will be receiving part of the litigation uh, funds related to um, opioid settlements from ph pharmaceutical firms. We will be, we're doing this planning across behavioral health and public health. Next week, we invite the public to attend our town halls to hear our survey results and a proposed spending plan, as well as to provide additional input based on those plans. The events will be next Wednesday, August 30th at 5.30 p.m. for the English virtual town hall. And then in Spanish, we'll have an in-person event in Watsonville at the city building on the fourth floor. So that's Wednesday, September 6th at 5.30 p.m. for the Spanish in-person event, which will be also family friendly. Look for details on our county and public health social media pages when um, and those will be released very shortly. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Teresa Gutierrez. Today I stand before you as the co-chair of the Justice and Gender Commission to advocate for the continued operation of the women's jail and to address several crucial aspects that demand our attention. Our goal is to not only keep the facility open, but also to institute changes that promote the well-being of both inmates and their families while upholding the highest standards of justice. First, it's imperative that we find a way for children to visit their incarcerated parents in person and be able to share and embrace. The emotional bond between a child and their parent should not be hindered by the circumstances of incarceration, especially when a significant portion of the inmates are awaiting trial. Fostering these connections could lead to positive outcomes for both parents and children. Furthermore, we recognize the importance of ensuring access to prescription medication upon release. Collaborating with the current healthcare provider within the jail to facilitate a seamless transition to necessary medications post-release is vital for the overall health and stability of the individuals re-entering society. This step contrib contrib can contribute to a reduction in recidivism and promote successful reintegration. In addressing the concerns related to the Prison Rape Elimination Act, we advocate for an unbiased and thorough review. To guarantee imp impartiality, we propose that the newly appointed inspector auditor be entrusted with reviewing all PREA-related matters. 
matters. The independence of this entity will help us instill confidence in the community that our commitment to the safety and rights of inmates is unwavering. It's essential to recognize the distinction between belief and knowledge. While the sheriff's beliefs are valuable, a neutral external entity ass assessment of PREA compliance carries greater weight. By embracing this change, we set an example for transparency and accountability that other communities can look up to. Finally, as we embark on this multifaceted endeavor, we acknowledge that the path we're car carving may be unprecedented, yet the absence of prior precedents should not deter us. Instead, it challenges us to rise above, launching innovative solutions that can reshape the landscape of correctional facilities and inspire others to follow suit. Let us remember that our actions today can reverberate far beyond our immediate jurisdiction by advocating for the women's jail priors, prioritizing family connections, ensuring access to medication and enlisting an impartial review process. We are not just safeguarding the rights of the incarcerated, but leading the way towards a more equitable and just future. Thank, Thank you. you for your consideration. Thank you for those comments. Good morning and welcome. Uh, good morning, supervisors. Uh, my name is Greg Benson. Um, I, I took part in the, uh, the annual point in time, um, a homeless headcount survey and um you know to see the 22 percent reduction so-called reduction um that's balderdash and i'll tell you why because i i woke up at four in the morning because i i didn't feel like it but i'd written 40 of my dead friends names on my shirts when i woke up people that had died on the streets that woke me up um it was a rainy bad bad day and i can you know we can we can I'll talk with you, Justin, perhaps, or send you a, an email. And um, I don't need to litigate, but uh, people were trying to have it canceled that day. Um, nobody wanted to. I didn't want to get out of the car and look anywhere, but it was just, it's its completely statistically off. And um, we've got to fix that because that that's not only, I mean, it, it's money for the entire county for, for all the programs. Um, and the, the trickles down to us, <clears throat> but um, also it's just nice to have a truth out there, you know, and to really know what's going on. And uh, I promise you, and Justin knows how stubborn I get, um, but in a friendly way, um, we've got to figure out a way to, um, that's got to be corrected. And I've got forensic accountants and statistical analysis people back from my old days. Um, let's figure out something um, and uh, let's work together on that and make it right. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good Welcome. morning. Good morning. My name is Maria Luna. I'm right here representing Monarch Services. I have been doing um, in custody services for six years um, when JAG first started. Um, been doing the work with survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking. I want to thank you um, for the services we are able to provide, which is the um, confidential crisis line, our safe release program. Um, I also want to say that we need to keep Blaine open. And everything that Celeste just mentioned is very, very important. And the other big one is my the PRIA reports we need an outside investigator it's really hard for someone that's investigated its own prison rapes um that is in-house we need someone outside um i also just want to say thank you for giving me this time to speak and i would really recommend that if you would like more information and stories um reach out reach out to us um, you know, ask questions. We have a lot to say. I've been in there. I go in there every week into main jail and Blaine. I have a lot of stories. And so this is our county. And I just want to say, I just want to say thank you for giving me this time. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Yeah, good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. You know, sometimes I just ponder why human beings are on earth. I'd like to see, I'd like to think it's to help each other. You know, there's been a lot of discussions, maybe not so much today here about the fires going on. I don't know how to really verify that there appear to be thousands of wildfires going on right now. 
you know, over 360 just in uh, British Columbia. You know, three years ago, I mean, I was a direct witness to uh, those lightning fires. I hadn't really seen anything like that before. You know, unfortunately, you know, not many people here were killed, unlike what happened in Maui. Some people say 1,300 children were burned alive in their homes because the water was turned off. Electricity was left on. And um, the pictures that I've seen match very closely to the directed energy weapons attack that happened in this county three years ago. I wish more people that knew about this and my the people I'm around would be here talking about it. So, you know, why are we actually here? You know, everybody's pushing these stories. You know, they talk about climate change. It's really climate terrorism. Um, there's a lot of evidence out there that people that control various militaries are causing these fires. Um, it's just really kind of sad. I mean, we're pushing this zero carbon. Both plants and human beings are carbon-based. Our human, hemoglo, hemoglobin, hemoglobin, excuse me, is iron-based. The only difference between the plant blood is that it's magnesium-based. So, I don't know. I'm kind of familiarizing myself with a book called On Message. How a compelling narrative will make your organization succeed. You know, Splank has written an entertaining, insightful guide to crafting messages and business life and politics. Thank you. His advice is dead. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us? Um, seeing none, Madam Clerk, is there anybody online? Yes, there are two speakers. Linda, your microphone is now available. All right, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. Um, well, good morning, uh, Chair Friend and uh, members of the board. I'm Linda Marin. I live on Smith Grade in Bonnie Doon, um, and I'm attending today to encourage you, as others have as well, um, to review, review the county's very out-of-date franchise agreement with PG&E. I watched firsthand after the CZU fire, well, after we were fought our own CZU fire here on, on Smith grade, um, I watched the PG&E's contractors fell countless healthy trees um, that were significant distances from any power lines, leaving owners in Upper Bonnie Dune shocked and outraged and burdened with the cost of removing those large and numerous trees. Um, from their properties. And those were trees that were providing habitat and increasing, uh, increasingly sequestering carbon as they stood. So it's no secret that PG&E's wildlife and vegetation management is compromised and even dangerous. Um, and why is it that the wildfire mitigation plan of PG&E compares so poorly to those of other California utilities like Southern California Edison, for instance? Fortunately, our county's commissioners on the environment are well informed about these issues and they've done their homework and they've shared it with you in the packet. And I encourage you to take guidance from them in considering updating the franchise agreement that the county enters into to deliver energy to the residents of Santa Cruz County, because surely we can do better. Thank you. Thank you. Call in user 8204. Your microphone is now available. Caller user 8204. Your microphone is now available. To unmute, you can use star six. Hello, my name is... And I'm putting out a call to action today for all people in Santa Cruz County to participate in exiting the WHO. In the WHO, de in a WHO declared emergency, World Health Organization, here are the plans for your future. The end of American sovereignty, no freedom of choice for medical care, mandatory injections, no exceptions, surveillance, loss of privacy, loss of rights, liberties, and freedoms, loss of personal choice and informed consent, 
global control and a one world government equals global totalitarianism. You can participate in exiting the WHO by going to exitthewho.com and um, learn more there. You can get involved with some quick action steps and uh, let's be sustainable and equitable in keeping American sovereignty for all. So go to exitthewho.com and help out. This is uh, something for everybody, not just party people. So I, I implore you to go to exitthewho.com today and to help us participate in keeping our sovereignty for America. All right, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. I support exiting the World Health Organization as well, and I also support the Valley Women's Club on renegotiating the franchise agreement with PG&E, which stands for Poison, Gas, and Explosions. PG&E should be dismantled. Seems like how many ways can corporations destroy the planet? I have in front of me a publication called Wise Traditions from WestonAprice.org, an article, podcast interview with Naomi Wolf on the Pfizer documents expose. This is from this summer. The interviewer the Pfizer documents on the testing of the COVID-19 vaccines were released by court order in March 2022. A detailed analysis of the documents reveals that not only was Pfizer's COVID-19 injection far from safe and effective, but it was intentionally designed to harm the world's population and impede human reproduction. Naomi Naomi Wolf, journalist, activist, CEO of The Daily Clout, and author of books such as The Beauty Myth and The Bodies of Others, walks us through the many shocking revelations of the War Room, Daily Clout, Pfizer documents, analysis reports, now available in book form. Over 3,500 doctors and scientists participated in the project of analyzing the documents. One fact, there were 42,000 adverse effects in the three months after the rollout. 36,000 of the adverse Thank events you, Ms. were in the United States. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. There are no further speakers, Chair. Thank you. All right, we'll bring it to the board for consideration of the consent agenda. Uh, Supervisor Hernandez, do you have any comments on the consent agenda? No. Thank you. Supervisor Cummings? Thank you, Chair. And I just want to thank and appreciate all the people who came out and spoke with us this morning. Um, item number 19 is a the approval of the nominations for the 2023 CSAC uh, Challenge Awards. Um, I just want to thank staff for the recommendations that were made, um, but I do um, have to, um, I'm going to vote yes on this, but I, I don't support the, the recommendation of the core program for this award. Um, I think that that program is off to a good start, but it's obviously been a little bumpy. And um, right now I know that staff has been working to get feedback from community members and from different board members on how to improve the program. So I think after this program has gone through some approvals that it would likely be um, something that I would support in terms of recommending it for that award, but I can't support that recommendation at this time. However, I will be voting yes on that item. Um, item number 20. Um, is the, the FEMA, um, the quarterly status report on um, FEMA and public assistance for the county's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the CZU lightning fires and the atmospheric rivers. Um, I want to appreciate this update from the county as well, but I, I do believe that, you know, I think it highlights the need for us to continue to put 
pressure on our federal elected officials. And, um, you know, even if it takes us writing a letter to the president, because um, with all the different disasters we're seeing over time, um, these delays and this critical funding are just going to keep getting longer and longer. And we need these critical funds to support our county services. And so my hope is that we can continue to figure out how we can expedite us being able to receive the funding um, that uh, we desperately need and um, has been a result of some of these natural disasters that keep continuing to occur. Um, item number 21, um, which was brought up by members of the community around the response to the justice and gender report. Um, I just want to appreciate the sheriff's for, uh, department for getting back to us with their responses. Um, I also share the concerns raised by the justice and gender co-chair and the people who spoke on this item. Um, I know that there's, we've received, I've received some feedback uh, from community members that are concerned that Blaine Street might be shut down in the future. Um, and I think it's important that we try to figure out what we can do to keep it open um, as long as possible. And I also um, share the concerns and um, and share the concerns related to visitation and medical medication distribution upon release. Um, and I also just wanna um, acknowledge uh, something that the sheriff's department brought up, which is something that's common across many departments, which is that we're having issues with staffing and recruitment and retention. And in order to run these programs, we really need to try to do our best to staff up um, our different departments as best possible. So we're not burning people out um, by making them uh, work too much overtime. So I hope that as we continue these conversations around recruitment and retention, that we're also acknowledging the needs in all the different departments, including the sheriff's department, health services agencies, and the many other departments where we're seeing vacancies. Um, I think that concludes all my comments. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Coning. Supervisor Coning. Thank you, Chair. Just a few brief comments on item 33, the telecare agreement, which includes $20 million for psychiatric health facility and $14 million for the crisis stabilization program over a two-year period. Um, I primarily want to thank the health services agency on this one um, for really, we have had some challenges uh, in this area, and I appreciate that uh, HSA is digging in to provide a greater level of technical assistance and improve operations, particularly as far as uh, our process for around 5150 uh, holds and transportation to and from the jail. And I also appreciate that it's uh, just a two-year contract and uh, will provide an opportunity to reevaluate in the near future. On item 40, the Heart of SoCal repair for $140,000. I want to thank Parks for their quick work on this. You know, we spent a lot of time talking about all the work we're doing on roads after the storms, but of course, Parks uh, had many millions of dollars of damage as well, um, particularly in the first district, since um, people may have not realized most of the stairs that go down to the beach are in fact county park facilities. So uh, already we've had some great repairs at 26th, 20th, 12th. Uh, I know more repairs are in the works for 38th um, and other plus well-known coastal access points. So again, my appreciation to Parks for all their work on this and, and general responsiveness to the community. Uh, and finally, item 46, the uh, improvements to Redwood Road. I'm going to abstain from voting on this item since I do have family that lives on that road. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Kono. Uh, Supervisor McPherson. Uh, thank you, Chair Friend. Uh, I'm going to address uh, items number 16 and 19 on the strategic plan update and the CSAC Challenge Awards. Um, you know, every time the uh, county strategic plan and operations plan are on the board's agenda, we should really be thinking about the counties and thanking them uh, of the executive teams for this effective management tool that was introduced by CEO Carlos Palacios and carried out uh, by the executive staff, Nicole Colburn in particular should be mentioned. Um, this really creates a framework for uh, the county staff to work better as a team to focus on accomplishing the objectives that we're, we're targeting and to be increasingly transparent and accountable to the community we serve. And, and it's working as evidenced by the challenge awards that this county in competition with the 57 other counties in the state of California, year after year has received uh, re awards from the county or the California State Association of Counties or CSAC. Um, I'm excited to see that three more programs uh, apply for another round of the challenge awards, the core investments, neighborhood courts, and OR3's bridge internship, internship program. Um, these, these are innovative and effective initiatives which the county can be proud of and which the grand jury even has addressed some of them and really given, given some really uh, high marks to. Um, on 
Item number 20, the FEMA reimbursement update, as was mentioned previously. Uh, again, I want to thank the county st staff for keeping the board so up to date on the situation with our FEMA or Federal Emergency Management Agency um, reimbursement processes. Um, thank you especially uh, to Allison Violante from Chair Zach Friends staff for working closely with our congressional partners uh, to free up some of those funds. Uh, my office has uh, also communicated numerous times uh, with our congressional representatives who have been very responsive, uh, including the rec as recently as yesterday, how critical it is that received this funding. Um, it seems that the situation is improving, but it's not fast enough. Uh, to put the need into perspective outlined in our report today, uh, the $65 million we believe FEMA still owes the county is equivalent to the general fund budgets of parks, OR3, probation, public defender, and the county clerk combined. That's big. And that's why we are in a real tight financial situation in the county, or part of the reason anyway. So we'll keep on hitting the message uh, and bring, trying to get it home. Uh, and we know our congressional leaders will help us as much as they can. Um, in regard to uh, the written correspondence that's on today agenda, today's agenda and some of uh, our constituents, especially in the 5th District, have responded to, um, I want to thank the Commission on the Environment for this uh, information about PG the PG&E Franchise Agreement, and especially appreciate the 5th District uh, constituents who brought this forward to the board today. These are really serious issues that uh, PG&E will need to be addressed, uh, be addressing on the state level in partnership with other communities. And I, I understand the county staff is looking into uh, auditing the franchise uh, uh, agreement fee situation, and it's welcome, and we need to do it as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. A couple of brief items here. I just want to appreciate the board's support of the letter of support for SB 620 in regards to uh, low impact camping areas, which will greatly improve equity and access for a number of uh, residents throughout the state for access to these open spaces. It's just um, a lot of recreational opportunities are limited because of, of cost or availability. And so to have low cost and uh, greater availability for these kinds of locations will be very important. Uh, on the FEMA item, uh, I think it's first, I appreciate Supervisor McPherson's acknowledgement of Ms. Violante's remarkable work on this. And I just wanted to point out also that the National Association of Counties, of which I serve on the National Executive Board, is now taking this up as a priority issue uh, to Supervisor Cummings note about the advocacy. Uh, unfortunately, we're not alone in having this issue across the country. And so now the National Association of Counties uh, is doing even stronger advocacy in regards to trying to free up some of that money. FEMA, of course, uh, is dealing with disaster after disaster after disaster. And so uh, it is important that we constantly keep uh, the reminder that that there are a number of communities across the country that are still building out of previous disasters and have spent a significant amount of money on those issues. And so uh, I appreciate the board's continued support on that, and I will continue to work with uh, NACO on those that issue. Lastly, uh, just on the, the Westridge item and the South County Service Center, it's, it's just great to see that continuing to move along. This is going to be a um, a great component for access for South County residents as well as for uh, South County and even beyond employees that will not need to make the commute. Um, some of those that desperately need the services, the county are currently uh, commuting very far uh, in order to receive those services. So to have that building up and running and it's moving closer and closer every day as this item notes is very important. All right, I'll bring it to the board for a motion on the consent agenda, recognizing one abstention from Supervisor Koenig on the Redwood Road item. I'll move the consent agenda. Second. All right, we have a motion from Supervisor Hernandez and a second from Supervisor Koenig. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye, and that passes unanimously with one abstention. We'll move Sorry. on to the Oh, sorry to interrupt, Chair. I thought that Supervisor Cummings had a no vote on something on the consent agenda related to uh, the core one item matter. Is that right? Yes, and maybe I can get some. Well, I need some clarification on that. Part of what I was trying to do is support the agenda item with the one caveat of making a statement of not supporting the core um, item that was 
a part of that agenda item okay, because so there were three so you, recommendations with three or four recommendations within that one item. Okay. Um, so you're a yes vote on that item. Yes. While also just making the, for the record stating that I don't support the core. Okay. Thank you. There. Yeah. Sorry for the interruption chair. Yeah. No, it's okay. Thank you, Council. We'll move on to the first item of the regular agenda, which is item seven, a presentation of a check in the amount of $394,000 from the Friends of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries for the new Aptos Branch Libraries outlined in the memo of the CAO. And this, as I was just fortunate to just tour with um, Damon, thank you for that tour of the Aptos Library. It looks so good there. I mean, I, I'm so excited to have the community check it out and a remarkable work of the Aptos Branch Library friends who uh, have done a lot to really help secure this. And so I believe we have a, a Ms. O'Driscoll. I can't see the chambers, but I believe that you were there. I'm here. All right. So go ahead and, and fire away. Thank you. My name is Janice O'Driscoll, and I am president of the Friends of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. I'm accompanied by Bruce Cotter, the executive director of the Friends, and by Eric Howard, who is the assistant director of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. The Friends are advocates of public libraries, as we demonstrated when we worked for the passage of Measure S to revitalize all 10 branches of the library system. The Friends are fundraisers. We have successfully conducted a series of capital campaigns so that we can stand here today seven years after the passage of Measure S and know that at the end of this year, nine of the branches will have been upgraded and reopened to the community. The people of Santa Cruz County love their libraries. They are vigorous users of the services. They make their votes known at the ballot box and they are generous. In the most recent capital campaign, which spanned 2020 to 2022, in spite of a pandemic, in spite of a long lockdown, in spite of anxiety of the times, the friends were able to raise over a million dollars for the support of the Garfield Park branch, the Branch of 40 branch, and the Aptos branch. They are very generous people, and we stand here now supporting those donors who have made it possible for the friends to present this check for $394,000 toward the construction of the Aptos branch. I don't know what will happen at the ATM, but <laughs> so maybe we should go take a picture. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, wait, yeah. <laughs> <Back in there. laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This is so cool. Thank you for that. Are there any supervisors would like to make comments on this item? And Mr. Chair, th this is so cool. Um, this is um, 
The Friends of the Libraries is a great organization um, that works so hard to support the measure of S um, ballot measure in 2016 that gained 70% of the votes. Uh, really remarkable, but just generally to support our branches, that all 10 of them, the staff and the libraries and their terrific program. And I never miss the opportunity to thank the county voters who supported that measure in 2016. We have a tremendous library system and it's being made better by your contributions, particularly from what we see from Aptos uh, for that library, a phenomenal a building, and it's going to be much appreciated by county residents for many years to come. So thank you. Thank you for those comments. I mean, Aptos before the closure on any given day was a, was either the second or third most branch in the entire use branch in the entire system. It's really a community asset. It isn't doesn't just serve the residents of the second district. It does serve uh, residents from both the first and fourth districts pretty commonly as well. Uh, the new facility has a greatly expanded children's and youth area, a, a special area for teens and little study areas for teens and adults that has a great new technology area. It's wide, it's open, it's environmentally sound. It's got a lot of natural light. I think that uh, people, it's evocative of both uh, the redwoods and the sea with with some of the design elements. It's a very, very special place. And and uh, we were, as Ms. O'Driscoll noted, and I know that um, uh, some of the board members that are still serving today worked on the Measure S uh, committee to do this outreach. It's a once in a generational opportunity to upgrade libraries that haven't been upgraded in 30, 40, or 50 years in certain cases. And, and we're definitely appreciative of the voters that supported this and giving them uh, libraries that are worthy of this community. It's, it's very exciting to see uh, the Aptos branch open at the end of the year. Are there any other comments from board members or um, Mr. Palacios? I know you and Ms. Coburn uh, work on the, serve on the library board as well, if there's any comment you would like to make. Yes, uh, on behalf of the, the Board of the Library Joint Powers um, Authority, I'd like to really thank the friends of the library for your work. Uh, I know how hard they work to give us report at every one of our board meetings. And believe me, it was not uh, an easy thing to raise the amount of money they did. They had so many events and they've uh, been so tireless in their efforts. And so we really do appreciate it because this is crucial in getting all the amenities we want at that beautiful library. and. Uh, like the rest of the board, I can't wait till it opens and the community sees it. It's going to be a great, great addition to Aptos. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any member of the community that would like to address this on this item? It's a non-action item, but it is an item on today's agenda in chambers. Madam Clerk, is there, I'm seeing none. Is there anybody online? And then I see uh, Supervisor Hernandez. We do have one speaker online. Thank you. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Well, I appreciate the friends of the library in their work. I call on your organization to assure a safe and healthy environment with wired computers without Wi-Fi microwave radiation assault. This is not an environmentally sound uh, library or any of them. I used to love to go to the library. As a teacher, I took classroom children to the library. But I, I, I avoid it now. Why? I have in front of me a brochure, Wi-Fi in the library, question mark, convenience or health hazard. And there are over 3,000 studies conducted worldwide on the cell phones, cell towers, and other wireless technologies. About 70% of all studies show one or more health effects. 
symptoms include neurological symptoms of headaches, dizziness, which I experience when I go to the library briefly. I hardly ever go. I pay taxes for it. This is the elephant in the room. And um, Wi-Fi is a barrier to people with disabilities because exposure to Wi-Fi radiation can trigger seizures in people with epilepsy, heart arrhythmias, and people with certain heart conditions, asthma attacks, people with asthma. Cellphonetaskforce.org is a good source of information, as is bioinitiative.org. Make the library safe for everyone. Remove the Wi-Fi microwave radiation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Is there anybody else online, Madam Clerk? No further speakers, Chair. All right, Supervisor Hernandez. So I just wanted to extend my my uh, thanks and appreciation to the Friends of the Library. Um, you know, it's an extraordinary uh, fundraising effort that they've done. And I think that this uh, library, of course, is going to be an asset to not just Aptos, but the entire county. Um, you know, having served nine years on the on the Library Finance Authority in the past, it's always great to see uh, contributions, uh, fundraising efforts that go into the library because they're greatly needed in the libraries. Uh, libraries many times serve not just as as libraries, but as community community centers now, and so that's always you know appreciated by library staff and the community as well. So thank you uh, to the friends of the library. Thank you for those comments. All right, we will close this okay. item and we'll move on to the next item on the regular agenda, which yeah. is second. I, I apologize. Yeah. I couldn't see you, Supervisor. Please. Yeah, I just wanted to also thank um, friends of the library and extend my ongoing support and just appreciation for everything that they do to help make our libraries such wonderful places for our community to visit and to, um, to have access to in terms of having access to information or just a quiet and peaceful place where they can read a book or um, enjoy a moment of silence. Um, I had the, um, I was at the Branson 40 grand opening and that was such a beautiful library and was just down in Capitola at their library. I didn't have anywhere to go to do work. And so I was able to just drop in and spend a few hours there. And it's just great to have those types of places where we can, um, you know, go to and, and, and work in if we need somewhere to go. And so just want to, you know, continue to be able to support friends of the library as we move from our Aptos branch and hopefully to our main branch here soon in the near future and, and continue to have these places be beautiful, accessible places for our community. And chair, I'll just add uh, my, I'll also extend my thanks to friends of the libraries. I grew up going to Aptos library and I'm really excited to get in there and see what the renovations look like. And also to take uh, my own daughter to the new, uh, the, the newly renovated library. I mean, every one of these new libraries that I go into is just, um, it's such an inspiration, uh, such a fantastic investment in in our future. Um, and of course, as mentioned, it's really a flexible public space. In fact, uh, I've gone to a number, we've held a number of public meetings um, at the uh, Capitola Library. It's become an essential meeting place for a number of our commissions. Um, so really a great hub. I'm looking forward to the opening of the Live Oak Library Annex soon too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all those comments. Uh, we'll move on to item eight, which is to conduct a study session to review updates on addressing homelessness in the County of Santa Cruz and improve and approve recommended priority goals for the next six month housing for a healthy Santa Cruz implementation cycle, accept and file progress report and implementation of the housing for a healthy Santa Cruz framework and direct the human services department to return in February, 2024 with further updates as outlined in the memo of the director of human services. We have the agenda board memo and the housing for a healthy Santa Cruz six month Update, we have um, Director Morris and Dr. Ratner here for the presentation. I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair, friend. Good morning to you and to board members, uh, to county and city colleagues watching and to members of the community. Um, thank you for this opportunity to discuss a, quite a different item than celebrating the library. This is uh, arguably one of the most difficult public policy issues facing the state of California and our community and uh, quite a humanitarian crisis, but this is uh, our responsibility as a human service department in this county to work together um, with you as our elected officials, with our county colleagues, with our city colleagues and community to try to um, 
make a dent on this challenge that is uh, very complex. I'm going to make a few introductory remarks, and then I'm going to turn it over to Robert, and the clerk of the board is going to lift up a PowerPoint, and then he will go through a formal presentation. Um, I just want to make sure to remind the community and the board, and for those who are new to this topic, that we are in front of you at the two and a half year mark of a three year strategic plan, which means we are just finishing up this first ever three year strategic plan. Before this three year strategic plan, as many communities struggled with this growing crisis, there was sort of no framework to follow to try to sort through how to navigate this complex issue. I think it's important, particularly with our city colleagues, that all the mayors are new and three of the four city managers are new to remind everyone that this is not the county strategic plan, this is the community strategic plan. We came to your board asking for commitment to be the lead facilitator of this effort, but then we went to the four city councils asking for their support to adopt this so that we would work together collectively on these ambitious goals. Couple points to note, like most strategic plans in California and the country attempting to address the issue of homelessness, this plan is absent identifying specific funding to pay for how we will achieve the aspirational goals. And it is also absent any delineation of what the county or a city will do. And that is on purpose because we are working together to come together to apply for funding to figure out the answers to these questions, which unfortunately are not answered by the state or the federal government. So as we position ourselves to end this strategic plan and prepare for another, I wanna share with you what I see as a human services professional working in the safety net for the last 30 years. As I look at the Housing for Health division run by Robert compared to all the other safety net programs we run, because I see a set of very complex structural challenges that we have to concurrently work in advocating with the state and federal government to fix because there are limits to what we can do locally without changes to these structures. But I wanna share with you what I see. Um, but then I'm gonna end with some comments that woven into Robert's presentation are some hope and some optimism that we're on a good track. So let me list the challenges as I see them. First, we cannot lose sight that we are talking about an affordable housing crisis. It is absolutely true that we need to talk about services, mental health issues, substance use issues, and a host of public assistance programs. But if we lose track of the main issue in our country, in California, and in Santa Cruz County, recently deemed the most expensive place to rent in the United States of America, if we don't recognize that we have an affordable housing crisis, and just focus on the services we need to provide, we are never gonna bridge the gap to help unhoused or people who lose housing find housing. To bridge the gap between people's incomes, low wage earners, people on fixed income through SSI and what it costs to afford housing until we can address the affordable housing crisis. We are sort of um, nibbling at the edges of a bigger problem. Number two, budget. As I look at the human services department budget that your board approves every year, 95% of the budget that I manage that your board approves is stable, predictable federal and state money. When we look at the budget Robert's division manages, it is the opposite. 95% of Robert's budget that he manages is one time state and federal grants all with expiration dates. We were in front of you a year ago to tell you that the COVID money in response to the pandemic that brought a huge infusion of federal and state money was about to expire and we called it cliff one. And when that money terminated, so did all the shelters that we stood up to help people experiencing homelessness not uh, get the virus. We are about to face cliff two. And thanks to the federal and state government, we were given another infusion of money to help all those who are moved into emergency housing to have services and supports to be able to move not back to the streets, but into housing. And you'll hear in Robert's presentation that has been successful. But I want to highlight, and I probably will another time, this would not be successful without the partnership of the local housing authority. The housing authority and the vouchers are what bridged the gap between the cost of housing and all the services we're trying to provide. Last comment about budget, we have a challenge in this country, in California, and particularly in Santa Cruz County, 
which all the money that Robert's division manages from the state and federal government is categorically restricted. It's not open-ended money that we can do whatever we want with locally. It has rules. And unfortunately, those rules prohibit us from using the funding for emergency-only shelter, which is often the major ask that we get asked to fund, but we don't have money because it's categorically restricted. Number three of four, disasters. Up until three or four years ago, disasters were now and again fires, but we have had seven EOC activations in the last three years, as community knows, and the conflation of trying to manage the strategic plan and disasters is creating two issues. Number one, more and more people are losing housing, which exacerbates the challenge because of these disasters. And number two, we add to the challenge of what to do with those who are unhoused in the middle of a disaster, which is creating a lot of chaos and a lot of expectation to respond and take the limited money we have to respond to the disasters in competition with everything else we're trying to do. But the fourth and final challenge I want to share is by far the most complex in my experience. And that is the complete lack of alignment between federal government, state government, and local government, county and city. And I wanna outline this because this tends to be where we spend a lot of our time trying to figure out what's the problem. At the federal level, we have two branches of government that have absolutely competing and different priorities. The primary funder of homeless and housing services is HUD. And about 15 years ago, they made a policy decision to stop funding emergency shelter only services. So all the federal HUD money we have does not fund emergency shelter only services. Yet another branch of federal government, the federal courts on the West Coast in particularly are increasingly intervening on local government, cities, counties, and the state, Caltrans, from disbanding encampments unless local government can find funding to help people when you disband an encampment go into emergency housing. So the funder of the services says no emergency shelter, yet the courts are saying you can't disband an encampment. It's quite a dilemma that's being created by two different branches of government. There is a misalignment between the federal government and the state government. The federal government has dictated as a matter of policy, the responsible party to address homelessness at local government is the continuum of care or COC or what we call housing for health partnership. But who in California knows what a COC is unless you're on the inside? <laughs> California, in turn, puts money out to everybody from multiple departments. COCs can apply, cities can apply, multiple county departments can apply, CBOs can apply. So there, it, the money spread everywhere. So there's a misalignment. And all of this leads to the challenge that's happening at the local level where cities and counties are left to figure out what to do with this maze. And when times get tough, cities and counties fight. And when we work together, you will hear in Robert's presentation, we actually make progress. And the communities that are making progress are figuring it out. The communities that are struggling are fighting. So I hope this very complex framework of challenges, I just wanted to lift up because there are limits to what we can do and we need to continue to work to advocate for a resolution to these structural issues. But let me end with some hope. Number one of three, the point in time count. Um, the public comment earlier, comments on social media, they're all correct. I want to affirm the point in time count is a flawed federal mandate. We have to do it in January. We asked for a waiver to wait for the January rain, so we did it in February. It's a tremendous lift to pull it off, and there are flaws in the process, but it is the same metric that's measured every single year, and it points out that what we have done, and this is what I'd really invite the board and the community to hear, point in time count is just a day. But look at all the trends of all the information materials and everything Robert's about to present. It all lines up with what the point in time count showed. We are making progress. And that progress is because of partnership and braiding of complex funding streams to try to move the needle. And Robert will share more about that. Number two, equity. You will see the city of Santa Cruz 29% decrease in the number of people experiencing homelessness and what Robert will present and is in the materials tells why. However, Watsonville, 15% increase, predominantly families living in cars displaced by disasters in the economy. 
I'm putting this in the comment of hope because you will hear in Robert's presentation, we saw this inequity, a lot of focus on North County over the years in this community, but over the last few years, we have been leaning heavily towards investments in Watsonville. And it takes time to build up programs, but we are moving in the right direction. And last but not least, and this is where I'll end, if you are not aware of this level of detail, our governor, Governor Gavin Newsom, who has arguably put the most amount of money in history into this issue, is sort of, this is my commentary, getting tired of cities and counties fighting. So he made an act of legislation in this last fiscal year that going forward, he will not fund local government for any new grants if we're fighting with each other. He will only fund local government if we have a new strategic plan showing that we are going to work together. So the solution going forward in the current political and funding environment requires us to build upon the partnerships we've built, work together, put our differences aside, or we will not have funding available to us. So with that said, I hope these framing comments are helpful and I'll turn it over to Robert to go through the PowerPoint. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, members. slides up in a second. Um, I wanted to first just provide an outline of what I'm planning to cover with my brief presentation and, and then, then we'll, we'll have time, have time for, for questions. questions and answers at the end. And there we go. Thank you. Uh, so first I wanted to follow up on some of Randy's comments and share investments and the impacts of those investments over the past six months and year. Uh, many of those dollars that Randy alluded to came from one-time state and um, federal investments related to the pandemic. Highlight in a little bit more detail what's working and making an impact on people's lives who are experiencing homelessness. Um, then an overview of what the pit count, the point in time count showed and some other data and how we're doing addressing this issue. Wanted to review some of the work that our division is doing with partner county and city agencies on developing new permanent and short-term housing. And then a more detailed update on the funding situation and then what we're planning to focus on over the next six months. On the bottom of the slide um, is a quote from a public health art, uh, journal. And I first got interested in this idea that everyone should have a home when I was an undergraduate student living in Los Angeles. And at the time, the conversation was, why are there so many people? This is a new phenomenon, so many people without homes. And this uh, scholar and physician wrote an editorial essentially saying that homelessness is a policy creation of disinvesting in low-income and affordable housing that happened in the late 70s, early 80s. And I think one of the things I've observed as I've remained committed to this idea that everyone should have a healthy home is we've kind of forgotten the story of how we've gotten to this moment, that we collectively at the national, state, and local level have failed to invest in enough affordable options for people. And if you're someone who left an institution or you're struggling with health issues, uh, the main reason why you can't have a living situation is because it isn't a place that you can afford. And certainly we need to do a better job of transition, helping people transition from institutional settings back to community. But if there's nowhere for them to transition to, you can throw every amount of service at folks. But if there's nowhere for them to land, it doesn't work. And I hear a lot about the need for more and improved behavioral health services, which I'm completely supportive of. Most of my career I've spent in behavioral health care. And I know we can do a lot better than we are in this country in meeting the needs of people with mental health and substance use issues. And as someone who worked in a um, psychiatric residency program, I knew and I continue to know that it's really hard to help people with mental health and substance use issues if they don't have somewhere to sleep that's stable every night. So um, I think that that's a primary thing we need to keep in mind. And this affordable housing gap is really critical. And I found it a little bit of frustrating, a little frustrating. The University of Washington put out a book, Homelessness is a Housing Problem in 2022. And there was all this press about how this is new and insightful. And one of the metaphors in that book was uh, housing policy and addressing homelessness is like musical chairs. Well, it was known that this was the case back in 1990. So if we really don't collectively work on the fundamental under opinions of why we have this problem, we're still going to be struggling. So I think it's important that we all keep that in mind while we address the consequences of not having enough affordable housing. So this slide is an overview of the investments and impacts um, last fiscal year. So our division is managing 44 programs, either indirect 
indirectly or directly with contracts between the county and a nonprofit organizations. We budgeted $23.2 million. And I think it's important to highlight that because this board and the leadership in the county supported the creation of this new office, general fund investments in addressing housing and homelessness have increased substantially over the past five years through a combination of increasing general fund, but also having staff to go after all these grants that Randy alluded to. It takes a lot of time and energy to apply for and secure funding. Um, so I wanna applaud the board and the leadership here at the county for investing in us and our division so we could bring in some more resources to support the community. The investments resulted in, and the data on the right comes from our homeless management information system, a fairly mandated data system for certain programs that are addressing homelessness. So we're 4,500 people experiencing a risk of homelessness were served in the last fiscal year and close to 2,500 exited those programs. And of the people that exited, around 37%, uh, 911 exited to permanent housing. And that is an increase from prior years in our county. And it's also a little bit higher than the average in California. So HUD has reports available through uh, the federal government of 2021, looking at how states and jurisdictions are doing in terms of their programs address homelessness. So we're exceeding the average, but it's lower than I would like it to be. I'd like us to be way above 40% and the number of people who come into programs and exit to permanent housing. Um, the other part of this story is that about the same number of people that enter programs exit to places and we don't know where they're going um, because the programs haven't had enough time and capacity to build relationships. We fund a fair number of programs that are very emergency response oriented. So if you're open for two to three days, it's hard to build a connection with someone and to find out where they're going to go next. So the programs that have the largest number of exits to unknown destinations are the programs that are only light touch, light relationship building with clients. So if we're going to reduce the number of people we serve um, that exit to unknown destinations, we've got to focus on developing better connections and funding programs that allow staff to build connections with people. The geography of the investments, I wanted to highlight that most of our funding, because it's coming from the federal and state um, sources, it's about 90% from federal and state sources, has to be countywide for the most part. There are examples where we can use those dollars to focus on specific regions. And because a lot of the demand and interest in addressing homelessness is focused in the northern part of the county, I think that there's a general bias. My estimate um, is around 80% of those countywide dollars are invested in the northern part of the county. Um, and then if you look at this slide, about 2.7 million of the fund is devoted to North County programs and 1.9 million to South County programs. So what is working? Randy alluded to this, and I um, tried to emphasize this in my introduction. The Having been involved with this issue for many, many years and hearing from providers and people experiencing homelessness, the, the thing that makes the most difference is if we help people close the gap between what their incomes are and what it costs to find housing. What we were able to accomplish with the pandemic funds and this amazing partnership with the housing authority is um, helping over 900 people move into permanent housing because we got a substantial increase in long-term housing subsidies um, from the federal government and the housing authority. We coupled those vouchers, which are really hard to use in the most expensive rental market in the country with other funding for services that um, staff focused on using a model called strength-based um, care management. And we also had incentives and education for property owners. And all those things together with the partnership, I think, got us to this point where we are um, in reducing the number of people who experienced homelessness in the point in time count. Um, if you look at the data with 349 vouchers were added due to these federal pandemic investments and 708 people who used to be homeless moved in over the past year and a half. So that's a huge portion of the 911 people that exited homelessness during the period of time. I think some other things that have been happening over the past six months or year is that our shelter and transitional outcomes, shelter and transitional housing outcomes have been improving. I think in part because of the relationship building and focusing our funding on the services that people need to secure housing. We've expanded through grant applications, some money for rapid rehousing funding. 
And we're doing a better job of coordinating across our programs. We've got a long ways to go and, and data. And I, I think the success we've had primarily with the work with the Housing Authority has helped us be more competitive for grant applications at the federal and state level. So the point in time count, Randy alluded to the fact that it's a flawed methodology, and I want to echo that point. And it is um, used at the federal and state level on a very consistent basis as a driver and an informing uh, data piece for policy. So we have to pay attention to it. And my personal view is that we generally aim to keep the methodology consistent. So when there are changes in the count from year to year, there's something else going on besides the methodology. And people will um, have differences of opinion about what's going on. Um, I've been in a fair number of uh, conversations where it's clear that when the number goes up in Santa Cruz County, people believe it. And when the number goes down, they don't believe it. So I think we, we can't have it both ways. We either don't believe it consistently or uh, we believe that it's telling us something. But I don't think it can be both things simultaneously because if you don't think the methodology works, then just be consistent that you don't trust it. Um, but don't accept it when it's high and deny it when it's low. Um, so the the headliner, I think, from the count is that we saw a 22% decrease overall, and it's the lowest count ever in this community since 2007 when these were mandated by HUD. This is the lowest it's ever been. Um, all the jurisdictions in the county except for Watsonville saw a decrease in the number of people experiencing homelessness. Randy alluded to this in his points. We saw a 15% increase in Watsonville. We saw the highest percentage of Hispanic Latinx um, individuals ever in the point in time count. 44% of the people are estimated to be Hispanic Latinx. and was 35% um, of the general population in our county. This is a trend that's happening statewide, not just here in Santa Cruz. The Hispanic Latinx community has shown higher increases in homelessness since the pandemic. And I think it's a combination of um, political, social, economic forces that are impacting that community. Um, again, we uh, see consistently that people who are experiencing homelessness are primarily losing housing in this community. In this county, it was 75% statewide. That's a similar figure. Most people who are unhoused in California and in our counties are from California and from the county where they are unhoused. About a third of people who are homeless are employed. Um, and many people that are social workers and work in this field are having trouble finding and keeping housing. It's heart wrenching for me to have social workers who have clients who have housing vouchers. They're helping them to find housing and they get a notice from their landlord that the rent's going up and they can't afford to live here. I've had three stories come to my attention of staff who are doing this work who've left the work because they don't have vouchers and can't afford to live here. So again, it's, it's an affordable housing issue that's impacting many of us. Um, of the folks who are unemployed, about half of the people in the county said they're looking for work. In our community, we don't have dedicated shelter or temporary housing for transition age youth and um, underage minors. Hopefully that will be changed because we submitted an application for funding to set up a youth focused transitional housing program. But nearly all of the minors and youth in the county that were homeless were unsheltered. And the other key point in the data is that homelessness among families with children has been increasing. And in the data that's primarily been in South County. And I think as Randy alluded to, we don't have perfect information, but putting some data pieces together, I think a lot of people are living in vehicles. Um, it's not on this slide, but the point in time count also showed that a large number of the unsheltered in Santa Cruz County are living in vehicles. It's the highest it's ever been. If my memory serves me correctly. I think it's 46% of the unsheltered are living in vehicles, according to the point in time count. So um, those are folks who often recently lost housing and still have some assets, or maybe are still working, but just can't afford to live here. I uh, wanted to share some updates on some housing projects that our division has been working on. Uh, the Many members of the board are familiar with some of them. We applied for and secured funding for three project home key projects. Casa Azul is with Housing Matters at seven units, a conversion of a dental, um, old dental office into housing, which I love. There's opportunities for converting commercial into housing. This will probably be the building that has the first group of people moving in, which I'm really excited about. Um, Park Haven Plaza, 
in Soquel, 36 units um, on its way to getting de developed. And then the Vets Village in Ben Lomond already has veterans and folks who've been impacted by the acquisition of that property. And we're working with them to secure the money needed to really remodel that and um, have the village become what we hope it will be. Uh, the County Behavioral Health Department has helped secure funding through another source at the state level, the No Place Like Home program. And there's four projects, close to 100 new supportive housing units for people homeless with serious mental illness, uh, the Harvey West Studios in Santa Cruz, Jesse Street in Santa Cruz, um, Vienna Star, um, which is uh, Capitol, a very exciting project that's close to being leased up, and another project in Watsonville with Eden Housing. And then we have two temporary housing projects we're working on and we secured funding for through collaboration. So we partnered with Monterey County, Watsonville and the uh, um, Pajaro River Management Authority to secure an encampment resolution grant to create a new navigation center in South County um, for people who are living in encampments along the Pajaro River. And after that grant's over, we're developing plans to sustain that effort and maintain it as a high quality navigation center long-term. And then we are partnering with our county behavioral health colleagues on a behavioral health housing project and using some whole person care funding to get a new behavioral health focused temporary housing program navigation center up and running in the next year. Uh, funding updates. So this slide lists some of the funds we've secured over the past six months. And this is uh, part of our, I think our tradition of presenting to you all new funding that we're bringing in and updating you on funding that we're losing. Uh, the Behavioral Health Bridge Housing Funding, one-time grant of 10.2 million that we partner with the Behavioral Health Department on. The encampment grant, um, the block grant, uh, Homeless Housing Assistance and Prevention Program, HAP4, we secured um, that grant quicker than most other counties because we have strong collaboration between our continuum of care and the county government. And because we are working um, together so well, we were able to get essentially get an advance on those funds. So before we actually have expenditures, we have the money coming into the county's bank account so we can get some interest and then help more folks. Um, permanent local housing allocation, working with our colleagues in community development infrastructure applied for and secured some funding that we'll be using in our department. And then one of our nonprofit providers, decided not to continue to apply for HAPA funds, housing opportunities for people with HIV and AIDS. And we decided we would take that on and apply for the funding and secure those dollars. Uh, alluded to this, 90% of our funds come from federal and state grants. Um, most state funding is a multi-year um, discretionary um, from the standpoint of the state and federal government. So we have no reassurances that the funding will be there in subsequent years. So we have to plan um, the use of block grants and spread those dollars over multiple years to get some semblance of sustainability of programmatic interventions. And then uh, I know many of you on the, um, uh, well, two of you on the board are involved with the Katuma of Care process and know that every year we have a ritual of applying for funds and we're in the middle of that now through the Katuma of Care process and it's a competitive process. Most of the time we get all of our grants renewed, but there are some that are at risk. There's opportunities to make adjustments. And I am uh, really concerned, Randy alluded to this, about the, the big cliff that's coming. Um, the first cliff was for the shelters and this next cliff is for the services and the the resources we have to partnership with the housing authority. So we're going to have to find ways to address that big drop in funding during this fiscal year. And that leads to what are we doing the next six months? So um, just to build off what I just said, one of the things is we're going to apply for as much funding as possible. And then um, the fifth bullet on here is a reflection of the state shifting a lot of resources to Medi-Cal managed care plans for addressing homelessness. So as local government agencies and community-based organizations, we've got to learn how to be, and I'm a healthcare person who's now working in human services, but it takes a long time to learn how to be in the healthcare universe and to bill for services and understand how Medi-Cal works. So we've got to make a lot of progress in that area over the next year if we're going to have any success in closing that um, financing gap that I mentioned. Randy alluded to this, um, the next block grant of funding, the HAP5 funding from the state, 
requires that we at the local level develop an updated plan to address homelessness. Conveniently for us in our county, our current framework expires December 31st. So we're due to update our plan anyway. A lot of other jurisdictions don't have that alignment. So they're having to negotiate with the state whether the plans that they have are gonna work or not. Um, I think key to updating the framework from my perspective is showing that we really can align around um, shared understanding of how we're going to invest our funds and be more realistic about how much money we have and how we're going to invest those over the next um, period of time that the state wants us to look at. I anticipate the state will be recommending a three-year plan, um, but we don't know what the requirements will be yet. That new plan is going to be due to the state on or before March 31st. So our next update to the board will be in February and will include um, information about where we are with that planning process. And there are going to be three required public hearings um, before that plan gets approved. So there'll be a lot of more conversations over the next six months to get this updated plan together. Um, really trying to get these housing projects, community development projects moving forward. Um, I hope in the next six months I can report back. We've got people moving in and pictures of people moving into their units, um, which will be really exciting for the many people who've been involved. Um, there's an effort currently underway to improve our HMIS data and collaboration and data sharing, along with how we um, coordinate our services and people access services. We're in the beginning stages of that process and hope that over the next six months, we'll see a lot of improvement in that area. And our, our team in Housing for Health and many people in their community are really um, invested in raising the voices of people who've lived through homelessness in Santa Cruz County and hearing their perspectives on what worked and what didn't work and what we could do better. So we've um, been doing some fundraising to create some paid positions and opportunities for people who've um, got valuable life experience that they can add to our effort. Um, so we're going to get that going in the next six months. And then uh, we, I believe, continue to need to improve and coordinate our efforts to outreach to people who are unsheltered, both in vehicles and living in encampments and living on their own. Uh, we did secure some funding to start a new street outreach program for unincorporated areas of the county. And want to share with the board that there are no dedicated funding outreach programs currently for those parts of the county. So um, we have to stretch the money and programs that do outreach to cover those areas. So I'm excited that we'll finally have some dedicated outreach for those geographic areas in the county that haven't had that kind of attention. And I also want to be clear, we don't really, we don't have enough outreach um, for anywhere in the county, but particularly for the unincorporated areas where we don't have any dedicated funding. I think this is an uh, opportunity for us to demonstrate if we resource it, um, the impacts we can have with more coordinated outreach. That's the end of my presentation and wanted to open it up for questions and comments. Thank you, Dr. Ratner. Are there questions from my colleagues? I'll start with uh, Supervisor McPherson. Uh, yeah, I, um, this this report and the data show that we, we are making progress. It's pretty pretty uh, troubling of what some of the, the statistics show. But on the other hand, I'm encouraged that the point in time numbers have gone down by 22%. Uh, as you mentioned, it's a flawed methodology. It's not at the right time, probably in, in January, but it's consistent. And that's what we have to, that's what we can go by with what we're doing and the, what we've put in place with the funding that we have. And I believe we're going to, we're going in the right direction because we're focusing on permanent housing and case management and prevention. Um, a couple of questions. The report mentions that nearly um, of the nearly 2,500 uh, program exit this last fiscal year, uh, over 900 of them uh, exited um, to permanent housing. Uh, that's 37 percent. Is that above or, or below what you were hoping for or what you anticipated? <laughs> well, I hope for 100 percent. Yeah, um, that's my. Um, dream aim. And uh, I alluded to this earlier, our, our framework calls for 40% of people exiting shelters and transitional housing to exit permanent housing as a goal. And we're not there yet. And we're above the state average. Um, so I would, I would say we're making progress. It's trending in the right direction. I'd like to see us collectively with all of our programs at least over 40%. Right. Um, so we've got a ways to go. I will say that when I looked at the statewide data, the trend is every community is going down. 
um, in California in terms of the numbers of people coming to programs that are exiting the permanent housing, which is the wrong direction. Okay, and they re the report also says the reduction in the number of people counted in the uh, the point in time uh, year over year is lower than the number of people we helped secure housing. But this data really reaffirms that uh, the number of households uh, losing stability in their uh, living situation outpaces our ability to help them return to permanent housing. Can you explain that further? Yeah, I really appreciate the question and I regret that I didn't highlight it a little bit more in my presentation. One of the things about working with people who are currently experiencing homelessness is we're working in the housing market as is, and we've made a lot of progress, the 911. But if we look at our data on HMIS, the number of people coming to ask for help yeah. um, every month compared to the number that exit, it's two to two and a half times the number of people that come to ask for help that compared to the number we're able to secure housing. Yeah. So it's the wrong formula. The, the forces that are leading to people having unstable housing are so great and beyond our current capacity within our teams and what we're doing to help people hold on to their housing. And then you've you've got more people losing housing than we can help to get back into housing. So it's, it's a formula that is a recipe for a continued problem. I appreciate the question. We've got to do more upstream to help people keep their housing while improving the pace at which we're helping people get back into housing, if we're ever gonna really address this issue. Well, I, and I appreciate your your statement that uh, this is a countywide, um, statewide, uh, nationwide problem, huge, and it's very complex. And it makes it more difficult for local governments, especially when we're so dependent, 90% of the funding to address this or solve it from federal and state resources. Um, and sometimes not consistent too. Uh, one of, many of them are one or two year grants that uh, are fine for a year or two, but then uh, we fall off the cliff, as you mentioned. So I appreciate your, and our, our four cities that we have in the county trying to work together as best we can. And I encourage us to continue that effort because I think when we do, we're going to get more results in a coordinated effort countywide. So I appreciate your efforts to make sure that's held together and we address it on a, a countywide basis. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I want to start by thanking you, Robert and Randy, for presentation today, but also really your work over the last few years. I mean, you've got brought just so much uh, professionalism and, um, you know, dare I say, process to addressing this issue. Um, you know, that process can feel slow uh, at times, but really, I think you know we were we were starting from practically zero in terms of uh, our, our systems and organization in approaching this issue. Um, and so it does feel like we are a lot better organized uh, and a lot better prepared to make more substantive gains in the future. I mean, and I think this report is really the most encouraging, most promising we could ask for. That's really the question at this point is, can we sustain it based on, uh, based on the funding? Um, but I mean, 911 access to housing is huge. And I mean, I would point out that um, you know, we only saw a drop of 495 people total in terms of the count. So I mean, with that, as you point out, there's a, a flow of people who are becoming homeless every day because of the high cost of housing. Uh, and we are able to address and house some of those people, a lot of those people, but but not enough. And this gets back to your point, uh, Director Morris, that this is really a housing problem. Uh, we've we've largely created it ourselves by outlawing uh, apartments in vast parts of our uh, our cities, not just here in Santa Cruz, but but statewide, countrywide, through single family zoning, um, and of course, just complicated complicated. Uh, uh, building process that adds a ton of cost and, and slows down our ability to address the process, uh, to address, address the housing crisis. Um, so a few questions for you. Um, the first is how many of the placements into housing were within the county versus out of the county? Uh, so for the housing authority voucher programs, uh, I think it's around 85, 90% of the people um, were able to secure housing in the county. And we had another benefit of the federal voucher program. Generally with vouchers, you have to find housing in the jurisdiction of the housing authority, but this particular program, emergency housing vouchers, let people look for housing outside. So I think it's around 10 to 15% of people found housing mostly in our neighboring counties, Monterey, San Benito, and Santa Clara. 
it's that's very impressive in and of itself. I mean, as you said, a lot of work on the ground uh, with landlords um, and with the residents or with the, the folks being placed themselves uh, to make that happen. But it's amazing in such a tight housing market to to find um, so many units within our county. Um, you know, or or so our goal for the three year uh, strategic plan was to reduce homelessness twenty five percent, twenty two percent this year. I mean, we're we're pretty good on our goal. That's encouraging. I mean, honest, obviously there, again, there are, there are flaws, um, in the count, but, uh, still it's, it's, it is, if anything, consistent, um, and we're making good progress. Um, but it doesn't seem like we've made any progress on the sheltered component, right? I mean, if anything, so our goal was to have half of, uh, the population experiencing homelessness sheltered. And if anything, we've backed it a little bit from, uh, 77% sheltered in, 2022 to now, uh, or oh, sorry, 77% unsheltered in 2022 to now 79% unsheltered in 2023. Um, and I know that we do offer some shelters which don't actually qualify as shelters under federal standards, but you know, our, in, and looking at those projects that you put on the screen of the various types, um, I mean, some, I guess, will qualify as shelters, but how do we make more substantive progress on that front? Yeah, I think the major reason why we've seen a decline in the number of people in shelter is we've just lost shelter capacity over time due to um, the loss of the COVID funding that allowed us to expand mostly hotel-based sheltering um, and other kind of congregate special <laughs> sheltering programs that we're able to put together. I did mention we've secured funding to create a navigation center with uh, in Watsonville that'll add 34 beds, um, but we're not able to sustain the current shelter plus the new shelter financially. So it'll be a net gain of 13 beds if we are able to pull that off. And with the Bayville Health Bridge housing funding, um, that'll be another 34 additional beds. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time mentioning this, but I'm very hopeful that our proposed transition age youth transitional housing program, which will have 21 beds, will get funded. So um, those that's 109 beds. And I think there are really some opportunities in partnership with the city of Santa Cruz. Um, they had $14 million available from the state to help address homelessness and part of what they invested in is securing additional land around the current Housing Matters campus. You know, the neighboring parcel, the city purchased that. There's opportunities for us to secure money to expand capacity there um, that I, I think can help make a dent in the need for more shelter. And I don't think anyone knows what the right number of shelter and transitional housing beds is for a community. If um, one looks at the data in California around the country, you'll see really different numbers of how much shelter people invest in. I think that New York state is a good example of if you just spend all your money on shelter, you have still have a really big problem with homelessness. So you don't want to spend all your money on shelter. Um, and I think when you do invest in shelter and a lot of the federal and state funding requires this, that the programming has to have evidence that it has services to help people get into housing. So if you're seeing programs where less than 10% of people are exiting to permanent housing, the funders don't want to support those projects. I mean, we want projects that are helping 40% plus of the people who come in that they can show that they can help people get back into housing. So my hope is that we invest in uh, regional high quality navigation center programs, low barrier, high quality services, the kinds of health services that people need, one in Santa Cruz, one in the mid unincorporated area, one in Watsonville, um, and then the youth focus one. And can we get those four projects to be really solid? And then can we help the privately funded shelters with fundraising, et cetera, to keep doing what they're doing? I think it's important to remember that in this county, most of the shelters don't use public money. Um, before the creation of our unit, there was very little public investment in shelter. The shelter that the governments were funding were winter only or storm-based shelters. And it wasn't until the state started to put money into shelter that this community started to invest in year-round shelter. Um, so I hope we can keep raising the money to get this kind of minimum four high quality programs and then keeping the privately run and um, community supported programs going. Um, helping with fundraisers, et cetera. Um, 
And our goal, I think, is a reasonable goal in our framework of 600 beds. And we've been trending in the wrong direction. So we've got to get all those things that I just described moving forward so we can get going in a better direction. And, and I'd like to piggyback briefly at the risk of redundancy. Um, I, I feel like it's my responsibility, having been in the safety net for 30 years, to share these patterns I've seen, which is uh, health and human services are predominantly funded by federal and state dollars. So often the answers to these questions come from what are the federal and state government funding? And what I have seen in my career in different safety net issues, this being probably the most complex housing and homelessness, do not underestimate the story we can tell to our state legislators and our federal Congress people, because I think the feds and state are hungry to find a solution. This issue is growing big. So I think at the risk of oversimplifying, there has been a disinvestment in shelter only funding from the feds. No surprise, there is lower shelters. So focusing on, not that this was your question, Supervisor Koenig, but focusing on trying to find a local solution to the emergency shelter crisis is in competition with our need to get organized, work as a county with our city jurisdictions, particularly Watsonville and Santa Cruz, and have our state affiliates California League of Cities and California State Associate Counties work together to tell the story about what the funding formula is, because right now we are really pinched to find dedicated federal and state funding to pay for emergency only shelter. It's only with this string of resources and it, that's the conundrum. So I just wanted to highlight that um, most of what we do in human services is based on federal and state policy, not local policy. And I think behind the answer to your question is federal and state priorities that shifted over the years and maybe they need to shift again, but that's not going to happen if we don't advocate and let's advocate together with the California League of Cities instead of fighting over why there's not enough shelter locally, which is happening all over the state. I think it's a missed opportunity to apply pressure where it needs to be applied, which is at the state and feds. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, I think you, well, as far as the shelter question goes, I think you answered my next question, which was that the last that last year, the, our big story was that we had sheltered most youth and families, and this year we're seeing an increase. And and I guess the answer for for why that's happening is simply just less shelter overall. I think it's uh, less shelter, but also I think that the economic, housing, social trends are contributing to it. I mean, we, the storms made it really hard for some people to stay in the situations they were in. Um, the kinds of work that people have been able to secure post pandemic and afford to live here, real stressors, huge percentage of students uh, at Cabrillo and UC Santa Cruz and unstable living situations, experiencing homelessness. So I think that the data is showing us certain populations are struggling, which, and it, it moves around. It's the musical chairs, which populations are really struggling with housing. Um, and what I see in the pit count data is some real need among families, particularly in South County, bubbling up. And then I think young people, many people who are trying to go to school in this community are struggling to find and keep housing. Um, so the next six months, we want to do what we can to focus on those things. And, and part of that is seeing if we can get some more capacity for shelter. Got it. I mean, and, and yeah, to your point, Director Morris, um, you know, this the way that we fund this issue through state and federal dollars is uh, of course one of the most frustrating parts of it for me as a county board member, uh, I expect for my colleagues as well, just because it means that we have so little flexibility in terms of how we direct the resources. Um, and I hope uh, Chair Friend can speak a little bit to uh, you know, our prospects of changing that um, in the, at least at the state level uh, and having you know more more flexibility. Maybe that comes with more accountability as well, um, but more flexibility and, and more certainty in terms of uh, how much funding we can expect every year. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Supervisor Cummings? Uh -oh. <laughs> Looks like we may have lost supervisor friend, but as vice chair, I think he was about to turn it over to me to see if I had any comments and questions on this item. So I'll just, I'll go ahead since we lost this connection. Um, you no, know, first, I just want to thank um, in particular um, of the current board, supervisor McPherson and supervisor friend who I know um, and along with our, our county administrative officer have really moved us forward to have a division um, that is dedicated to homelessness 
And over the years, we've been building that program out. And I know that previously there had been a time when the county didn't want to address homelessness. And under the leadership of our county administrative officer, um, Carlos Palacios, and the board members who've served um, over time, we've been able to actually build out a program that has been able to expand our ability to secure resources, to provide shelter, and to put in the services that our community needs to address homelessness. And so I just want to thank you all for the work that you've done over time to help us get to where we are now, which has shown that, you know, we're making a lot of good progress on securing funding and getting people into housing. 911 people housed um, over the course of a single year is just phenomenal. And so I just want to thank you all for that and for your efforts. Um, I'd also like to um, agree that, you know, while the point town count isn't um, perfect, it has been consistently implemented over time. And if we had seen just decreases in everything, maybe that would have been an alarm of, well, maybe people fled to drier places because of the storms. Um, but we saw reductions and increases in a variety of different areas, which shows that there is something that's happening. Um, we are seeing reductions in homelessness and a lot of our services are likely part of that, but we are seeing increases in areas that should be um, of great concern because um, if, if we're seeing increases in homelessness in South County, one thing that makes me think of a driving force is the potential for a lot of gentrification that can be happening with high prices in North County, leading to people moving to South County who are then competing with people who have lower incomes and those people are getting pushed on the streets. And so this is something, it's it's probably one of the biggest equity issues that we should be really focusing on is how we can stop that from happening. Um, and I look forward to seeing, you know, as this plan, um, our next three year plan gets implemented and developed, how we can try to address those issues over time. Um, I also want to just thank um, um, Robert and Randy for the transparency that was provided in terms of the numbers and where, like how much funding is being spent, where that funding is going, because a lot of people um, don't really know how the funds are being spent and allocated. And I think this gives us something to refer people to when those questions come up. Um, and then I, I guess the next just comment I have um, is that we really need to th start thinking about policies that will make housing more affordable and provide people with protections. We focus a lot on, you know, we need to build more shelter. We need to address the people who are on the streets, but it's also and what I've heard from this presentation is that when people get on the streets, it's really hard for them to get back into housing. And so how to keep them in their housing in the first place um, is really going to be critical for us to focus on in this next three-year plan. And I know some of the recent reports that have come out have really focused on needing to also have, in addition to sheltering options and programs, um, tenant protections and eviction protections so that we can keep people in their homes. And I know that the county uh, public defender has been working on, you know, right to counsel, and we've been having those discussions, which, I, which has been shown to actually reduce evictions in other communities. And I think we need to continue down that path, along with exploring other ways that we can help um, protect tenants who might be vulnerable. Um, and then um, one other comment I, I have too is that I really think that we also, as we're considering how to make housing more available, um, keeping residential property from becoming commercial properties. Um, we've seen in a lot of residential areas, homes being converted over to Airbnbs, and that reduces the amount of housing that currently exists that could go to people to actually live. And it also drives up the housing price. So I think, you know, we need to really be focused on you know, given that we're in a housing crisis, kind of pulling out all the stops in terms of how we can make housing more available, how we can make housing more affordable and how we can keep people in their homes. Um, and so those are all the comments I'll make because I can go on and on on this subject. But um, I guess the question that I do have is, you know, what will the next kind of process look like in terms of this next three year planning process and how will the county be engaging with the COC and other jurisdictions? And I guess and then maybe a little bit around the timeline of that. Yeah, thanks for the comments, Supervisor Cummings. And the question, uh, the planning process will be very dependent on what the state requirements are. So the California Interagency Council on Homelessness is supposed to issue official guidance on what is expected for this updated plan on or before September 30th. And so once we get that information, I'll have a better understanding of what are some of the key elements. But I do know based on the legislation, what are some of the expectations 
One is that we uh, really hear from the people who are running the programs and the services, what are their challenges, what are their issues. People who've experienced homelessness or are experiencing homelessness lift up their voice, gather the input on what's working, what's helpful, what's not helpful. Partnership with the housing authority is specifically called out in the legislation. So continuing to work with our housing authority on opportunities that they see. Um, and the process will include because it's going to be required and I also think it's a good thing at least three public meetings where we can get input from folks on elements of the proposal and I also personally think that we need to be more realistic in setting our goals and more specific than we were with the original framework I think that from my perspective, the framework has a nice skeleton of how to think about this issue and how to focus on it, but it doesn't have the details about where this, where's the money going to come from, who's going to do what, and when are they going to do it. So I think, the, and that's one of the principles in the framework is that we move closer towards more specificity um, and having goals based on the availability of funding. Um, I anticipate, well, need to have some outside support to pull this plan together because the staff who are involved with running the programs and writing grants and we're not able to have the kind of process that I would like us to have. So we're gonna probably need some extra help to have an open and, and fair process to get input. Um, the state is making some funds available to help with that process. I'm not sure when they're gonna release those funds. So that'll be important for kind of when we start it. And then I think, um, you and uh, Supervisor Koenig are both on the Housing for Health Partnership Policy Board, the COC Board. And I think that group's going to play a really critical role in providing input um, and feedback as we develop this plan in more detail. I don't know if you have additional clarifying questions, but um, I, I think what stands out for me, and I was not here for the local planning process that resulted in the current framework. Um, my sense is uh, I'd like to hear more from people who've lived through or experiencing homelessness, um, from property owners, managers, um, and from service providers Then I kind of see embedded in our current plan and make sure that they're, they're a part of the solution. That's great. Um, yeah, no, I appreciate all that. And um, yeah, just look forward to hearing more about how this process plays out and if there's any role that we can play or if there's people we can connect to all too. I'd be more than happy to provide our support. And I think I'd be negligent if I didn't mention, I'm a huge fan of libraries. I love that uh, <laughs> that contribution happened. And libraries are one of the few places where people who have different life experiences could come together and be in the same space. And I think they need to be part of the process. They've actually been part of this process. The libraries here have hosted community forums and meetings. Um, they've done, there's one tonight in Capitola where I'm presenting. Um, and so they're an example of a community asset that's really leaning in and trying to be part of helping to address this issue. Um, and I think the, the more that everyone just steps a little into doing something a little bit differently, we're gonna make progress. And Supervisor Cummings, if I may, could I respond to a comment you made? Um, this storyline gets lost in the complexity of the discussion. And I just want to appreciate that you, as I heard you, recognize that before your time on the board, Carlos as our CAO and the board members of which at the time it was only Supervisor McPherson and Friend made some very courageous decisions. And I just want to put this in context. Um, I started one month before the pandemic and the decision had made to transfer the homeless office, which was one analyst and then a grant funded second analyst. That's it. <laughs> And then a lot of work by the other to try to do what we are doing with 20 people and it's not enough. And the pandemic hit and we got a direction from the board based on CAO budget analysis that we need to do 20% budget reductions. So one of my first political meetings with my new boss, Carlos, was uh, what are we going to do about this homeless office you're transferring to my department? And he said, as long as I can get the board's approval, we need to hire an executive to help run this despite the budget challenges. So thank you, Carlos, for that. I don't know how I do this without that. And then we had a large community hiring process that led to the hiring of Robert. And now I want to connect another dot. A lot of questions come forward about you don't spend enough general fund. We are a general fund for county because we spend so much of our general fund money on unincorporated services not run by cities and property, <laughs> Prop 13 tax formulas and other things. 
in the presentation, it highlighted that from five years ago to date, the county committed $3.5 million of extra general fund, which built out the division that Robert now runs of 20 people. Half the positions are limited term because we don't have dedicated funding. But without that commitment, and this is the point I want to make, the math is different depending on you look at that has generated a six to 10 time return on grants that Robert's team has been able to secure. So without that county's commitment to create the infrastructure, which we could have had good reason if Carlos didn't step up and say, this is urgent and the board didn't say we must do this while we're in a budget freefall, we would never be where we are today, which is still not enough. But the storyline that the county doesn't commit general fund to sort of invest in this issue is factually budgetarily incorrect. It's just invisible because it's tucked in the people behind the curtain getting all this money. So I just want to lift that up. It's not enough. We have more to do, but there have been courageous decisions by the board and by our CIO to say we must, and we need to do more, but I don't know what we would do if we didn't have this division. So thank you for lifting that up. I just wanted to piggyback on that to share that storyline. Thank you. And, um, and there's more work to do and just want to thank you all again for being able to take 3 million and turn it into 24. Um, and so with that, um, I don't know if supervisor friend is back on the line yet. Cause I get, is he back on? Okay. So I'll just turn it back over to supervisor friend as the chair. And, uh, I believe that it's supervisor uh, Hernandez's comments, but just want to recognize that, that I'm no longer chair right now. Thank you, supervisor Cummings. Thanks for jumping in. Uh, supervisor Hernandez, please. Yes, so I also just wanted to thank also uh, our CAO, Carlos Palacios, for, you know, the story right now, storyline about investing in this as well. When the times are tough, that's when it's most critical, the need is most critical. Um, and also extend my appreciation to Dr. Robert Radner and, of course, Randy Morris and all the members of the Housing for Health Division, Human Services Department, for their dedication to housing, you know, I I just want to acknowledge your guys' relentless efforts. Um, and I agree, you know, with uh, Dr. Ratner and Director Moore's comments about needing more housing. Um, one of the programs I really appreciated is uh, Supervisor Cummings' uh, tenant assistant programming that was done earlier. You know, those are the kind of things that are really critical. Um, and I would like to see more policies and programs like that. That, that address and continues the support for uh, low-income housing, affordable housing, even a workforce housing, as as Dr. Ratner was saying, some of those issues are actually facing county employees uh, in our county. So whether it's, you know, streamlining um, the planning process here within our department, whether it's inclusionary housing ordinances or just, you know, simple first-time homebuyer programs, I think, we need all our all the solutions, um, a multifaceted approach, not just one solution uh, to these issues. And I think that you know, with the recent release of the the pig count, you know, it, it we've made progress, and also of course some challenges. Um, you know, it revealed some advancements across the country within almost all the municipalities, unfortunately, in, in Watsonville that is within the boundaries of the 4th District, uh, it had an uptick of 15% uh, in homelessness. Um, and, you know, we've made tremendous strides, though, in decreasing the number out in, in the North, right, 22%. But it, I think it really um, illustrates that we got to take a deeper look at these indicators with the lens of equity as to where investments need to be made in the county uh, to address this uptick in homelessness so that we can better address this crisis that's happening in South County. Um, and it, it, I think that it is, as it was alluded to, right? It's a different um, character that's happening over there it's a different situation and it's harder to, to find as well because it's families living in 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 automobiles it's not as as forward as it is in in the north but what's the initial plan to deal with this 15 percent uptick i think that i just want to suggest that i think it's going to need partners uh in south county to address this as well, because there's language barriers, there's uh, different cultural factors. Um, they also need to be part of.
part of the plan? Um, I just want to start with with a lot of humility as a newer member to this community. I um, benefited from having my former deputy director, Emily Bali from Watsonville. And one of her parting words is, I said, thank you so much for helping me survive during this. And she said, you got it. Please never forget Watsonville. And my new deputy director, Kimberly Peterson, is a former mayor <laughs> of Watsonville. So we're always trying to think about this. And in my introductory comments I spoke to, we have a long way to go but we have investments that are coming online. But the comment I wanna make, and I'll turn it over to Robert to specificity, is I think we have this wonderful uh, silver lining in the pandemic, which is the South County community-based organization leaders stood up loud and partnered with the women leading the health agency, the health director, the health officer, the public health director, and focused on an equity lens, how to address the needs of the entire county, but the pandemic was most hitting South County. So we, that just happened. And that was not just a concept that happened. And to what I'm hearing your point, Supervisor Hernandez, the South County community leaders and the South County Watsonville staff and your former <laughs> council, there's a lot of energy to say, don't stop this momentum. And we participate regular means to make sure whatever the next thing is, we keep that lesson learned and apply it. Doesn't mean you have to take money from somewhere else, but you have to focus equity. So I just want to recognize the shoulders I feel I stand on as a public partner to health and to all the community-based leaders in South who really stood up and said, we are here to help. So we are going to lean into the community-based organizations who just did an amazing job making sure South County needs were met as community providers. So we will piggyback on that experience. And then I'll let Robert say some specificity because we already have some ideas, of course. Yeah, thanks for the comments and the questions, Supervisor Hernandez. I um, completely agree with you that we need to listen and connect with people who are in the community and who hear and live and breathe what's going on and figure out what are some of the best approaches we can take. Two years ago, um, we looked at it, we didn't look, we applied for a family homelessness challenge grant with the state. And the idea was to partner with some of the local nonprofits that are part of something called the South County Housing Collaborative, which is a core funded general fund project. Um, to secure some additional funding. I was concerned at the time looking at the PVUSD, Power Valley Unified School District, that the number of children who are homeless according to the Department of Education definition, it's the highest in the county. And the definition includes couch surfing, unstable living situations. So not the kind of homelessness that HUD talks about, but often the precursor to living in your vehicles. So to, back then that was a warning sign. And now I, for me personally, the Pitt County sign, yeah, we didn't, tend to that as much as we needed to uh, during the pandemic. So this to me is a wake up call. Um, I think that South County Housing Collaborative that we're already supporting and working with your office, having more of our staff time um, in South County, talking to those folks and figuring out what we can do. Um, I think Supervisor Cummings um, comments about eviction, um, protections and looking at a legal right to counsel or things we're, we're definitely going to see if that initial investment is having traction and we should think about that in South County as well. The one other thing that um, I feel is particularly important for the board and the public to know um, South County, but also countywide is that some of the new funding available from the state requires each jurisdiction to get their housing elements approved. So um, I really want to work with the city of Watsonville and the board here. Let's get our housing elements approved by ACD so that we can go after more of the housing resources at the state. Um, and it's just the theme, I think, of the presentation that Randy and I are giving collaboration. Most of the money is coming from the, feds, the federal government and the state government. Let's collaborate, particularly in South County. Let's go together with a shared voice and unified vision to go after some of this money. Um, and would appreciate support from your office um, and organizations in the Watsonville area to kind of move on this. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez for those comments. Um, I'll just make some brief comments and I appreciate not just the work that you did, but also providing this breakdown so we have a better understanding of where and how the funding is being spent within the county and I share Supervisor Hernandez's concerns about the inequities of 
funding throughout the county. Dr. Ratner, you had mentioned uh, by your estimation, I recognize it's not an exact number, but your estimation and maybe 80% of the countywide money is being spent on the northern section of the county. Of the clearly allocated money was about 60% when we looked at those two numbers. So we know that that no matter what, it is a significant amount of our funding is going to the northern section of the county. Uh, yet, and maybe causally, or at least correlated, uh, there was a an increase in the southern portion of the county that did not occur in the north, which saw a reduction. And, and so um, I think that more directly to Supervisor Hernandez's point, I think that the board should be providing additional direction for us to look into this allocation. I don't think that this is uh, the intention of the all-in plan. I don't think this is the intention of a number of the equity initiatives that we've done. I don't think this is the intention of some of the core analysis uh, funding programs that we have done, uh, where we look at how the money is being distributed across the county, in particular uh, into disadvantaged communities throughout the county. So um, I would take your guidance on on how we can do it in such a way to provide an analysis that would be useful for the board for consideration of future allocations, because while I don't think that it needs to necessarily be uh, just populationally based or something like that, I do think that there needs to be some flexibility in how this money is moved, because you can't have uh, the county spending tens of millions of dollars in one section of the county that it's not in another area. Um, in particular, an area that that uh, has historically been and unquestionably been underinvested in in all services and access to government services, and the county has tried to lift up. Uh, we we had an earlier board item on the Westridge uh, Center, for example, tried to lift up for services. So my first question, I, I suppose, for Dr. Ratner would be, how would you recommend that the board address this funding inequity, and how do you suppose? Because one of the the recommended actions is provide direction for coming back in six months, uh, in regards to the plan, and and how can we look at ways to kind of smooth out that funding inequity? Uh, thanks for the question, Supervisor Friend. I have a couple of ideas, and definitely open to other ones. I think. One element of the new planning process should be exactly what you talked about, uh, a deeper analysis, um, and not just off of the top of my head, but actually advising us as staff to look at, you know, what, to the extent that we have useful data and it's imperfect, like who are the people that are being served by the countywide programs? Where are people actually securing housing? I think we could do more detailed analysis, kind of the geography of how things are playing out with people who are losing housing and so wh where are people losing housing and where are people securing housing? And then looking at um, where um, the programs are, the countywide programs are picking up new clients. Um, so one way in which we can address this is with our new coordinated entry process, the HUD expected process of assessing people experiencing homelessness. And when we create new programs, we can articulate, particularly countywide programs, we can have as a policy that we bring to the Katum of Care Board, we wanna have a preference for people from ge this geographic region for certain programs, in addition to looking at the, the distribution of funding overall. I think another um, strategy is to really look at, and we did this when partnering with Monterey County, what funds are available and can we collaborate with our partners in the city of Watsonville to apply for and secure more funding in ways that really meet the needs. And to the extent that we can support the city of Watsonville, the housing element and becoming the pro-housing community in terms of housing, um, the more we can align with the state's directions of getting approved housing elements becoming a designated pro-housing community, that increases the funding for juris availability of funding for jurisdictions. So I think leaning in on South County, and then from my personal experience, the process of making decisions about how core and general fund investments, the sooner the board starts those conversations around the equity issue and looking at the distribution of the dollars that we have some local control over, um, that can be a factor as well. And in, in looking at um, how with the next round of core funding, you know, how do we want to distribute those dollars in a way that addresses some of the disparities that you articulated? I appreciate that. I, I mean, I'm concerned also with just uh, when we just geographically create a bright line, because what, what we need, uh, these are evolving issues and you need flexibility in it, but nobody can look at 
uh, a distribution of estimated at three quarters, one quarter, or 80, 20, and, and be proud of, of how that is being equitably distributed. I mean, I think the county needs to take a very uh, serious and significant look as to how resources are being invested in in uh, the mid and south county area, not just in the northern section of the county. And uh, to Supervisor Hernandez's point, build up those relationships in ways that maybe we haven't historically uh, done, because it is a dis- it is a um, a more challenging area to to ensure that we have the correct data to know what the the sense of the problem is, and I, and I think one of the challenges also on on doing the analysis, Dr. Ratner, is I'm sure, I mean, kind of akin to the point in time count is that because of an underinvestment, I think that the data that we're going to have is going to be challenging to even show what the extent of the problem actually is, or may skew what the need actually is. Uh, but I think that. At the end of the day, we know that there's a growing problem in the South County that's not being addressed because of funding. And so to the degree that as part of this additional direction, when we when we come back in six months, we can look at a process that helps smooth that over time. I think that that uh, will be good. And I appreciate that. I do want to address there was a point that Supervisor Koenig had brought up in regards to the state and state funding and flexibility. Uh, and in, for that matter, in regards to the hearing that um, I'm testifying at in about an hour and a half here. Um, the state is functionally removing local flexibility on a lot of these funding in both behavioral health as well as uh, homeless services. There's uh, a movement to be more prescriptive in what it is, and that's one of the challenges. And it's going to, um, that's what the legislature is debating right now. That's what we're working on the amendments in order to ensure that that flexibility still exists. Uh, one of the challenges that we face in Santa Cruz County is that we've done a good job uh, leveraging money. We've done a good job with our accountability and showing how the money uh, is being spent. We don't leave money on the table. Uh, some other counties have struggled, or in particular, a couple of, of unnamed and particularly large counties in the state have struggled with this. And uh, that has led to, I, I believe, the governor's office trying to create more accountability protocols, but that one size fits all doesn't work for our county and can have uh, real impacts on our safety net here in Santa Cruz County. So that's what I'm actually here to speak about. So um, I, I wish I could give you a, a greater speech of hope, Supervisor Koenig, on, in regards to this, but actually what we're trying to do today is prevent um, this greater prescriptive element that's currently proposed uh, by the state. So I would like to open it up now to the community. I know there's been some members of the community that have been waiting for a long time on this item. So first we'll do it in chambers. If there's anybody in chambers that would like to address this, please feel free to step forward. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. You know, what I always appreciate about your presentations, Mr. Morris and Dr. Ratner, is that they're very human. You don't throw up a bunch of statistics and graphs and make everybody blurry eyed trying to make a point. You really talk with us and explain things well on a human dimension. So thank you. I really appreciate that. I um, have at times been a volunteer food deliverer for Teen Kitchen Project. So I've seen um, a lot of different living conditions. And the ones that always disturbed me the most were the ones in Watsonville, where people had lost their homes because of their health crisis. And they were staying with friends of friends of friends. And it was a very um, eye-opening situation. <laughs> so I think what we really would really help um, set help us set more meaningful, effective goals is to really find out why are these people homeless? What happened? COVID certainly had a huge piece in it. People lost their jobs. People lost their businesses. Utilities went up. They continue to go up. So why are they homeless? Is it drugs? If it's drugs, I really would love to see this county embark upon a pilot project using Ibogaine that can help people with their consent get off of the addictive pathway. Then we can teach them life skills that can help them help themselves and their families pull themselves out of homelessness and poverty and being dependent on the government to help them live. I asked this board why the county is using 12 practically new mobile homes that were given to the county 
during COVID for the transitional youth sheltering. They're being used as office space for parks department. Why aren't we using them for homeless shelter? Can I have one more minute? Yes, yes, one more minute, please. Thank you very much. So that's a travesty right there that we have shelter that was given to us and it's not being used as shelter anymore. I I demand that this county board look into that and hand over the keys to those trailers to the homeless services people and put them to use for shelter. I think that a number of people also became homeless during the CZU fire. I think that um, the Pajaro Valley floods had a huge piece in the increase in homeless families in South County this winter. So again, it comes back to the question is, why are these people on the streets or in their cars or couch surfing? Because that's what we have to know in order to help them help themselves. Um, I am happy to hear some discussion of the city of Watsonville being included. I think we should also include Capitola City and uh, Scott Valley because they also have homeless in their jurisdictions and we're all here to work together. Thank, thank you very you. much. I appreciate the extra time. Yes, thank you for your comments. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us? Uh, seeing none, Madam Clerk, or is there anybody online? Yes, Chair, we have five online. Thank you. Helen, your microphone is now available. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and Supervisors, County staff and community members. I'm Helen Yoon Story, Assistant Director for the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County, the county's designated anti-poverty agency for almost 60 years. We're based in Watsonville and serve over 10,000 low-income individuals annually throughout the county with programming including homelessness prevention and intervention services. Housing and homelessness ranked in the top five issue areas in our recent community action plan, not surprising given the last few years of fire, COVID, and recent floods. And as we all acknowledged earlier um, in the meeting, you know, our county had the dubious distinction of being identified as the most expensive metropolitan area in the county this year, or in the country this year, with a two-bedroom housing wage identified at just over $63 an hour. This is in stark contrast to the 20% of CAB's recent CAP plan respondents stating they make under $5,000 annually. That's just over $400 a month. County supported services such as CAB's rental assistance programming, youth homeless response team and navigation services, Watson Mill Works homeless work crew, South County Housing Connector, and emergency payment programs, including the Housing Assistance Fund, all serve hundreds annually and are critical to helping community members stay housed or be rehoused in this challenging environment. CAB has been actively engaged in the Housing for a Healthy Santa Cruz strategic framework and implementation. While encouraged this year that the pit count showed a reduction in homelessness countywide, it's disheartening but not surprising to see that the numbers in Watsonville, including Latinx families, has increased. CAP supports the report's conclusions that homelessness is primarily a housing challenge and that large income and housing cost gaps, including those we see in the city of Watsonville and South County, increase rates of homelessness. CAP further believes it's crucial that local jurisdictions, and I hope I can have about 30 more seconds. Please, go ahead. Thank you. CAP further believes it's crucial that local jurisdictions work together and with state and federal government to continue to bring resources for eviction prevention, like rent assistance, as well as very affordable low-income housing and the resources and support services to support them. Um, and so we hope that there's continued focus and collaboration there. I will now turn it over to our next speaker. I'm hoping she's next in line, CAB's Director of Programs and Impact, Paz Padilla, to continue our statement. Thank you. Paz Padilla, your microphone is now available. Good morning, buenos dias, Chair and Supervisors. As Helen mentioned, my name is Paz Padilla. I'm CAB's Director of Programs and Impact overseeing CAPS programming, including the homelessness prevention and intervention services. In addition to supporting the recommendation of the H4H report, CAP also encourages your, bo your board to support flexible, no low barrier rent assistance for families and households in overcrowded housing 
with two to three or many more individuals and families living in one house. Because of the gap between wages and sectors, such as a farm and service work, and made even, it made even worse by the loss of housing due to the recent winter storms. Many families in this overcrowded conditions aren't on a formal lease that would make them eligible for the majority of available rent assistance, or many be undocumented and ineligible for other assistance, making them especially vulnerable to homelessness. Further, as listed in attachment two of the report, we encourage your board to provide additional resources to the CAP-led South County Housing Collaborative to decrease South County homelessness in families with school-aged children and increase family housing stability and the equitable distribution of county resources where they are most needed. Additionally, we encourage your board to continue to collaborate with the County of Monterey and City of Watsonville to rehouse the over 50 Pajaro families, many with children in PVUSD schools displaced by the winter storms and are currently slated to lose their temporary lodging at a Watsonville hotel. Thank you, muchas gracias, for your ongoing focus and partnership on these issues. And please know that CAP stands ready to continue to collaborate to equitably resolve homelessness and housing vulnerability in Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Carol, your microphone is now available. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and Supervisors. My name is Carol Pohemus. I'm speaking on behalf of Westside Neighbors, which is a neighborhood organization of several thousand Lower West Side residents. Santa Cruz's Lower West Side has been greatly impacted by issues related to unregulated vehicle camping. There is a nightly average of 60 plus vehicles camping on just the four most impacted streets, Schaefer, Natural, Bridges, Swanton, and Delaware. The point in time data states that 46% of the 1,804 unsheltered people are living in vehicles. That is 829 people living in vehicles, the highest number ever. The Armory Safe Spaces program is great and Evan and Corey are doing a wonderful job, but their program has a waiting list of over 50 people who want to participate in the Safe Spaces program and who have already signed up for it. Providing safe spaces for people to park overnight with services makes so much sense. People sleeping in vehicles already have shelter. They just need a sanctioned place to park. Consolidated parking will provide for easier intake and access to necessary social services toward the goal of securing permanent housing. Consolidating parking also makes the delivery of sanitation services more efficient. The county has property it already owns to use for temporary safe spaces parking. We know that Supervisor Koenig is working on an ordinance to expand the possible number of safe spaces parking and we commend and appreciate him for this work. But residents are frustrated with years of excuses by the county for not doing what seems so plainly obvious to us. The fact that safe spaces parking is not discussed in this report is surprising. Please designate at a minimum parking for 100 vehicles per night at several locations throughout the county. This will alleviate both the issues related to unsanctioned vehicle camping in the neighborhoods and the challenge of providing outreach and access to social services for people living in vehicles out of necessity. Thank I need te 10 seconds, please. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Designating safe spaces parking immediately will alleviate suffering much faster than waiting years for future permanent housing to come online. Please prioritize safe parking areas and include this in a three-year plan going forward. Thank you so much for listening to our comments. Thank you for- Thank you. Caller. 3377, your microphone is now available. Caller 3377 to unmute, hit star six. Uh, yeah, my name is Keith McHenry, and I've been feeding the homeless for 43 years. 
and uh, and I was involved in providing the only hot meal for homeless people in Santa Cruz for three years of the lockdown. Um, I would say, you know, we have plenty of money, but the policies and uh, uh, dictated by both the federal, state, and local governments make this crisis impossible really to resolve. And as I'm sure everyone there is aware, we're entering into a severe Great Depression where mil- right uh, in March, according to Lending Tree, there are already nearly 9 million families who are behind on their rents and we're facing homelessness in the United States. So this is going to be, you know, um, you know, many, many more homeless people on the streets. And it's odd that I should uh, support somebody from West Side who has been uh, attacking the homeless for so many years, but she is right. They needs to be a lot more safe uh, parking locations throughout the county. And it's frightening uh, how many people lose their cars and get towed, and then they come to Food Out Bombs. I hand them the pup tent, and then we send them to the levee only to be uh, uh, swept from the levee. So the, one of the increases, even though the numbers are horribly bad, and to give the impression in the point in time count that the numbers went down is a, uh, um, a, is a tragedy because that means people are going to think the problem is being resolved and it's just only the uh, evil homeless that they see that are causing the problem rather than the county really re- um, uh, resolving the crisis. I get calls probably um, uh, often not as many as 20 a day from people that are seeking food and many of them express their anger that we have billions for ukraine but we can't feed our own selves here in the united states and so um i think that uh you know and then I, i've got to really point out that homeless people in this uh, that have to deal with the shelter program um the one thing that they uniformly ask is that jeremy Thank you, Mr. Be fired Thank because you. he is just like outrageously vicious and violent Thank you. Call in user two, your microphone is now available. I'd like to hear more comments by Keith McHenry of Food Not Bombs. Ask him his ideas for solutions. The title is in the program, isn't it? Our money is going to the military, industrial, nuclear, telecom, media complex, and not to feed and house people at home. I... Think back often to the trip I made in 1966 to the former Soviet Union, and there were not people hungry on the streets, and my second cousin paid about 5% of her income for rent in a small but very pleasant apartment near the forest. People in your um, meeting there have talked about shifting of priorities and where is the money coming from, and we need to have money stop being siphoned out of our county to go to this military industrial complex. And the pandemic, I call it, part of it was the Great Reset which is drainage of resources and diminishing the power of local government. And here's a quick quote. In one year, Tony Fauci, his cronies, his intelligence agencies, the pharmaceutical companies, and these billionaires from Silicon Valley have engineered a shift of almost $4 trillion from the middle class globally to a handful of robber barons. That's a quote from Robert F. Kennedy Jr. in a talk entitled When Money Intersects Public Health Policy. And you can see the whole thing at um, westonaprice.org and the Wise Traditions publication of winter 2021. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. We have no further speakers, Chair. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We'll bring it back to the board. This is an action item uh, for a motion. 
and ideally if we could get some additional direction i actually can't make the motion but the additional direction just in regards to the analysis on the equity side just empowering the staff to come back in six months with a look at those issues i'll I'll move the recommended actions with the additional direction that at the uh, next six month report, we have uh, additional analysis of uh, how we can more equitably distribute funding for homeless services throughout the county. Second. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Supervisor Connick. Is there any additional comments? If not, then uh, roll oh, please, Supervisor Cummings. Yeah, just one comment. I'm just hoping as well when this comes back, if there's or within this process of planning, um, if there's recommendations that can be considered and brought back around increased tenant protections and various tenant protections that can help um, people stay in their homes, I think that would also be um, helpful in this process. And I don't know if that's okay with the rest of the board, but um, I think that we have to take this at both approaches, the rehousing people, but also trying to figure out how we can keep people in their homes. And so I don't know if that needs to be made as a friendly amendment or if that can just be, recommended. May I ask a process question? I don't know if it's vice chair or chair friend. We, we will do both. Um, but if you want to codify it, I don't know how this works. We will come back for our general six month. We will include in it a review of the distribution of resources. And if I'm hearing Supervisor Cummings with a motion or not, we can make sure to speak to the tenant protection dynamics, the programs we have in place, and just speak to it as part of our presentation. But I defer to the board and council if that's a motion or not. But we'll we'll I'm tracking both and we'll make sure to speak to both at the next six month report. I'll, I'll consider it a friendly amendment and happy to include it in the motion. Sure. All right. It's Added as an additional amendment to the motion by the maker, Supervisor Koenig, and approved by the seconder, Supervisor Hernandez. Any additional comments? Uh, seeing none, if we got a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Friend. Aye. And that passes unanimously. Thank you for your presentation and for those that patiently waited to comment on that item. We'll move on to item nine, which is to approve and accept the terms and conditions of the seller financing agreement addendum number four, an updated vacant land purchase agreement to purchase real property located at 188 Whiting Road, APN 0510420, for a total purchase amount of $2.31 million and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the deputy CAO. Um, and Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. We have the board memo, the financing addendum, the land purchase agreement, and a number of other items here on the schedule. And for our presentation, we have, unfortunately, I can't see who it is, but I think it's the Director of Parks. Is that you, Mr. Gaffney and Ms. Oh, there we go, and Ms. Finley. All right, welcome. And we did, I just, I needed the camera to be turned around. <laughs> Otherwise, I was trying to make a judgment from behind and, you know, I, I didn't want to be wrong. So I appreciate uh, both of you for your presentation. Please, Director Gaffney. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the board. My name is Kimberly Finley. I'm the Chief Real Property Agent with the Department of Community Development and Infrastructure. I appear before you today to recommend approval of the seller financing and updated vacant land purchase agreement to acquire real property located at 188 Whiting Road for parks purposes. To further discuss the community need and envisioned use of the property, I will turn the presentation over to the Director of Parks and Open Spaces, Jeff Gaffney. Thank you, Ms. Finley and uh, board members, staff. I, I do wanna thank uh, Community Development Infrastructure Department for all the work they've done and in particular, Kimberly Finley to get us to here today and um, also CAO Palacios, thank you very much. Um, we've been working on um, developing the need, or I'm sorry, the need for a park has been assessed over the last seven to eight years in the South County area. And uh, we have gone out to the community on a number of occasions, both through our strategic plan pro planning process and also through surveys at community meetings and events. And it's, it's very clear to us as a department, um, both through the data and also just anecdotal stories, that we are in much need of a park in South County, as well as um, actually in, in District 3. So both District 3 and 4 are, are park forest districts within this county. So um, in that process, we did develop some of the community needs, and some of those were athletic field space. Um, we need 
open space and healthy environments for people to participate in activities that bring them peace and serenity. Um, we wanted to expand some of our county park friends programs, um, connectivity to open space, uh, and also some of the climate resilient practices that we're looking at. Um, and so in that process, we um, found some available space that was potential for parkland and we came down to where we are today. Um, so next slide, please. And that is this property at 188 Whiting, as we've talked about. Um, so this is an envisioned idea of where we could go with this. This would be some of this would be the interim uses. Some would be uses that would be long term there at the park property. One of the things we do think is it would be uh, vital to part of the process is developing partnerships with some of the local farmers, developing a lease program, potentially for farmers to uh, grow crops out there. Um, ag tourism as a, as a result of that, and also um, sustainable ag practices could be demonstrated uh, for local youth. Nature trails, um, there's also the potential to create an emergency evacuation point. So next slide, please. One of the reasons that we really um, highlighted this property in particular was its availability to uh, local community-based organizations and schools to do a lot of the youth programming and demonstration farms and agri agricultural practices. This would, of course, coincide with your typical expectations for a park um, where we would have these, as we talked about, the athletic fields, nature trails, rec programming. Um, in addition to that, we would be partnering with the Agricultural History Project at the fairgrounds, the city of Watsonville, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District, and as I mentioned, a lot of the community-based organizations and as well as the Alma Mutsun indigenous people. Uh, representing the area. Um, so next slide. I think also we would partner with a lot of the relatively close organizations that have done parks like this in the past. Um, they're all within less than an hour's drive of here. Um, a lot of really good information that things they've learned, practices they've developed, uh, programs they've created as a result of having the same type of park. So next slide, please. I just wanted to give a quick overview um, before I turn it over back over to Ms. Finley, uh, just so you have some perspective. Um, you can see the slide on the left and the slide on the right. Um, the slide on the right will give you, on the top of the screen, you'll see Paulson Road, which becomes Whiting Road right about the apex of the property up there. And obviously adjacent to that, you can see the Pajaro Valley Water Management Agency and open space. And then down at the bottom of the screen, you can see the Santa Cruz County Fairgrounds. Um, all of that means that we're connecting to existing open space land and protected lands um, and has a lot of potential for connectivity. So to provide a history of relevant um, board actions that have occurred on this matter, um, August 24th, 2021, we appeared in closed session to receive authority to negotiate an option to buy 188 Whiting. December 7th, 2021, we appeared in open session and received approval to enter into the option to buy agreement and associated vacant land purchase agreement. On February 28th, 2023, we received authority to extend the option to buy. And on May 31st, 2023, in closed session, uh, we received authority to negotiate seller financing terms. So this item has been pending for quite some time. Since entering into the option agreement, we have completed the feasibility studies necessary to recommend a purchase of 188 Whiting Road. Those feasibility studies include a phase one environmental site assessment, water quality and quantity studies, agricultural viability studies, a biotic report, and a determination on CEQA and general plan consistency. <laughs> The option to buy agreement that was previously approved in 2021 set an agreed upon purchase price of $2,310,000. That purchase price was determined by a uh, county contracted certified third party appraiser. Pursuant to the terms of the option agreement, we have now accumulated a $50,000 credit uh, for half of all monthly payments that we have made during the term of the option. We will also receive a $20,000 credit for the option deposit because we are exercising the purchase during the term of the option. So we have a purchase balance of $2,240,000. To help purchase this property, we have negotiated the terms of a seller financing agreement. The seller financing agreement requires a down payment of $1,100,000 with a seller finance loan of $1,140,000. 
The loan will be financed um, and amortized over 13 years with a 4.03% interest rate. The monthly payments of $9,400 and the down payment of $1,100 will be funded with a mix of Measure G funds, Parks Capital Projects funds, 2015 unmandated or unfunded mandate repayments, and park dedication funds. We now recommend the following actions. Approve and accept the terms and conditions of the seller financing agreement, addendum number four, an updated vacant land purchase agreement to purchase real property located at 188 Whiting Road in Watsonville, APN 0510421 or $1,140,000 with a total purchase price of $2,310,000. Authorize the close of escrow if and when all contingencies are met pursuant to the terms of the vacant land purchase agreement and authorize the chair of the board to execute the certificate of acceptance for the associated grant deed, escrow documents, and loan documents as required to effectuate the transfer of the county property, and take related actions as further outlined in the board letter associated with this item. That concludes our presentation today, and we are available for any questions. Thank you, Director Gaffney. Thank you, Ms. Finley. Are there questions from board members? I'll start with... Um... Supervisor Hernandez. So we had a, a really nice presentation from the from the friends of the library. At what point would we be able to do a partnership with uh could or would we be able to do a partnership with friends of the park to do a like a, a capital type fundraiser for this that can inc incur some of the costs that we're that we're uh, having for the for the project, um, would that be like a second phase that we can do some capital fundraising for for this project as well? Absolutely, uh, we have been in partnership with the County Park Friends nonprofit, our partners um, in everything, all parks throughout the county, and uh, for probably the last year and a half, we've been working with them as we've looked towards the purchase of this, um, and so they are well prepared and looking towards the future on what, especially, I think they're excited about the potential for programming, but also development of all resources available um, to us for this facility. That'd be great if we can raise funds to, you know, for programming, but also, you know, development as well. Absolutely. Questions from other supervisors? Supervisor Cummings? Yeah, I just want to <clears throat> start by thanking staff for that presentation. Um, I guess in terms of um, kind of next steps, so this is obviously the property purchase um, and I think to Supervisor Hernandez's point in terms of developing the different amenities of that park, that's going to be a next step. And I'm just kind of wondering in terms of the planning process and what the next step will be in terms of defining what the use will be of that space. Good question. Um, we're fortunate enough that we feel we can implement some interim uses right away so that the property doesn't sit vacant and not be utilized. Um, some of those may be uh, leasing it for farming as it is right now, as we develop some of the other infrastructure that we need to. And then also potentially athletic fields could be uh, right out the gate, um, something we could look at in the next nine to 10 months, potentially. Um, in addition to that, there are some very basic things that need to be done. Um, the site needs to be cleaned up. There were some folks living out there for a while. Uh, we need to do that. The entrance to the park that will now be a park potentially um, would need to be uh, changed in the way it is laid out for public use. There's a lot of little things that would need to be addressed, but right away we'd like to get some use on the property. That's great. And I, I've got to put my plug in, but I think for kind of longer term use and maybe some multi athletic field use, I know that there's been a lot of um, some people have been reaching out about trying to figure out how we can get rugby fields. And so if there's an opportunity to have joint soccer and rugby, and I know there's a lot of people who would be encouraged to bring rugby to South County as well and, and have that be another activity. So if there's opportunity for conversation. We'd love to have that offline. I can talk to Felipe a little bit more about that and, and see how we might be able to bring up some more activities down to South County. Happy to maximize the use of all our parks as much as we potentially can. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings, the captain of our new rugby team for the Board of Supervisors. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let me just 
So I want to thank Ms. Finley, who's been working very hard on the negotiation on this uh, and trying to bring what will now be the largest investment uh, in South County Park since the opening of Pinto Lake County Park. This is a pretty significant investment and it'll take uh, some time to be fully realized, but now it's coming into the fold and public ownership and I think will be very important for future generations in South County. So I just wanted to appreciate all the work that's been done behind the scenes on it. Are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues before we open it up to the community? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, um, I don't know where uh, former supervisor Greg Caput is today, but uh, when he hears about that, he's going to have a big smile on his face. He's been working at this for years uh, with the, the Parks Department and for, um, you know, he is he is uh, inconsistent and uh, uh, not arrogant, but uh, really, uh, he's been really pointed to say, let's get this done. Um, and then uh, Supervisor Hernandez for following up on that. Um, and I think this is another great example uh, recently of how the county is working diligently to improve the services and programming in the South County. When you look at um, the Watsonville Hospital Project, the county government center, and the work on the future of the Pajaro River and improving that, uh, we can be proud of all the funding and resources that have been invested and in, have been invested and uh, now will be more uh, heavily invested in the Pajaro Valley. I think it's a credit to the county that it's really taken a targeted approach to improving the services in the South County. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out, Supervisor McPherson. Any additional comments or questions before we open it up? Sure, Chair. I'll just add that uh, I'm also excited about the potential for this site. Um, we are already seeing a, a number of creative ideas for it, and I look forward to seeing those blossom with uh, the support of the community, active uh, rugby enthusiasts and other enthusiasts, uh, as well as hopefully some help from County Park friends. Um, and I, you know, you mentioned it in the presentation, but I do think the proximity to the fairgrounds there and the potential uh, evacuation site also just mean that strategically this is a, a good purchase for the county. Um, and I also want to thank Kimberly Finley for her work uh, in structuring a creative deal that ultimately works well for both parties. And um, also, I think I think that our ability to raise funds for the park should increase now that we have it in public ownership. I know that was a challenge when we went out for the grant previously, a uh, state grant. Uh, is that they said, well, hey, you guys aren't on the site yet, so why should we give you uh, millions of dollars for it? So hopefully, we've got a good answer for them when we go back. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Now open it up for the community. Is there anybody in chambers that would like to address us on this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I cannot agree more that South County needs a park. This is not the place for it. If you could please put the slide back while I talk about the aerial view of this, ma'am, it, it will become painfully clear. Where where do the people live that would be using this park? They don't live near this land. This park should be put on the county-owned property behind the um, Master Gardener's Place and existing community garden at the intersection of Freedom Boulevard and Crestview. That's where the people are. That's where the kids are. That's where the gardens are. That's where this park should be. You could put soccer fields there. The water is there. I'm not so sure if the water for a soccer field or a rugby <laughs> field is going to be there with a, an old agricultural well. This is not the place for a park. How are the kids going to get there? Are they going to ride their bikes on 152 or Paulson Road, which is even more dangerous? There's no bus service there except Sundays for the farmer's market. No bus service. And during the county fair. Where is the tie-in with the county fairgrounds? There's no access across that ravine. Who's going to build that access? I spoke with CEO Zeke Fraser about this. He's the new CEO of the county fairgrounds. He knew nothing of this. Maybe you've been talking with the kegbines and ag history, but they didn't tell the CEO anything about this. It's a surprise. So this is not the place for a county park that will serve the youth and the the elderly for recreation. It needs to be in a place that the county already owns. The, you already own the land on the bus route. It's easy access, it's easy water. Um, 
the farmland issue has been, there's farmland that has been for rent across the way for months and months. It's one not being farmed. One quick second, uh, Senator, using, just give an additional minute, please. Thank you very much. So banking that farmers will flock to this land and rent it and use it for farming is, is not realistic because they're not renting the land on the other side of College Lake um, to farm that now. <laughs> Using it for soccer fields is great, but again, where's the water and the access? It's, this is not where the people are. So who is it really going to serve? And how can any CEQA analysis of vehicle miles traveled make this pencil out? It, it's not going to serve the people in the way that we all want to do in South County. So please do not approve this. I, I am distressed that the county has already spent $50,000 in purchase order payments. We should not move any further with it and instead invest the money instead of $9,000 on a dream that maybe people will come to invest that money in improving the parkland on Freedom Boulevard and Crestview. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers that'd like to address us? Madam Clerk, is there anybody online? Yes, Chair, we have one speaker online. Call in user two, your microphone is now available. Wow, thank you, Becky, for a reality check. What Becky Steinbrunner stated makes total sense. I had no idea in your presentation by staff, you left out these critical points of the access, it's not where people live, etc. <laughs> it's just um, shocking to me how omission of facts is like, um, it's like a deception. Uh, you don't get the whole picture. So I agree with Becky. I also wonder with farmland, the pesticide used, how toxic sites are. And I was trying to picture where this location is. Um, the cross street, I remember going out to the fairgrounds um, from you know, the city of Watsonville. And there's a rather large cell tower near there. And I'm always noticing where cell towers are and I'm always feeling sick around where the locations are. So this does not sound like a good plan. We definitely need parks, but take up Becky Steinbrunner's suggestion. That sounds like a good place to put it. I'm not against spending that amount of money for parks, but we need to have it in a good location. I know that it's like $20 million just went to telecare, which my friend got picked up for and had a terrible time, not a blink of an eye to approve that money, but let's have parks where we need them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Are there any other speakers, Madam Clerk? There's no further speakers, Chair. All right, we'll bring it back to the board for action. I'd like to move the recommended item uh, is it A and B that we're moving um, on the recommended items? And I've got some additional comments as well. So is that a motion for all of the recommended actions, Supervisor? Yes, all of the recommended actions. Is there a second? A second. We have a second from Supervisor Cummings. Uh, additional comments, Supervisor Hernandez? Yes, you know, I'm just happy and, you know, seeing this vision finally become a reality as a dream come true for many South County residents. Um, we're proud to finally have secured this land and, you know, on behalf of the community, we look forward to opening it up to the public. I think this park acquisition addresses a lack of recreational spaces in, in South County. And it's like a region that's been under resourced in terms of open space, outdoor opportunities, um, with a dedicated focus on, on promoting physical, physical activity. The park is really gonna counteract a lot of the chronic health conditions that we're facing, especially amongst young people. Uh, you know, studies have always shown that positive impact of physical activity on both physical, mental, and emotional well-being. So it's something that's tremendously needed, you know. Um, I think the groundbreaking 
this is a groundbreaking project that exemplifies District 4 and the county's commitment to equity and a better quality of life uh, for everyone. Recognizing the scarcity of parks within the district, we hope to create a vibrant hub of activities that cater to people of all ages for, from landscape, greenscapes, uh, walking, versatile range of attractions, soccer fields, organic uh, demonstration farms. The parks can be designed to captivate the hearts of youth and families alike. I want to thank all the uh, uh, Board of Supervisors, my colleagues, uh, CEO Carlos Palacios, the Parks Director, and of course, uh, the, making sure that the whole deal went through as well. Uh, but I also want to thank uh, former District 4 Supervisor Greg Caput to help, you know, for helping identify this location and putting funds aside for the land, land acquisition as well and always being, uh, um, you know, a pit bull and making sure that this project happened as well. So thank you to him as well. And I think that's my comments. Great. We have a motion and a second. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. C Cummings. I, I just wanted to also thank staff for all their hard work on this. Thanks for getting us across the line. Nandis. Yes. McPherson. Aye. And friend. Aye. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. That, is, that is the end of our regular agenda. We have a closed session agenda. Uh, council, is there anything expected to be reportable at a closed session? No. All right. Then we will move straight into closed session. Thank you, everybody.